to the November, uh, November 7, 2019 Folsom Cordova Unified School District School Board meeting. We will begin the meeting with the pledge. Eliana, could you please step up and lead us? Oh, isn't this... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, and I thought last meeting was good. This was the best pledge, so well done. Um, at this point, I'm going to take roll call. Student advisory? Here. Mr. Short? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Mr. Hoover? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. Ms. Ranking? Present. Thank you. Um, and a short reminder before we begin, a broadcasting is being made at the direction of the board and that this broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Just wanted to let you know that. And to report out from closed session, the board directed our property negotiator to continue to negotiate. Moving on. Our first, um, we need uh, adoption of the agenda. I'll move it. Can you move that? Second. Moved by Mr. Clark, second by Mr. Short. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. We do have three um, three cards to request to speak on an item that's not on the agenda. If you're here to speak about budget or boundaries, we will um, uh, ask for your comments after the presentations for those items. Because we have so many speakers already um, expressing interest in direct, uh, addressing the board, Please be prepared to limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and also with our public participation, if you could try to do that as well. So the first speaker is um, Marquis Willis and Bailey Dagan. And I apologize. If, please uh, pronounce your name so that we can know the correct pronunciation. <laughs> okay. All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. 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 All right. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, come and talk about the current events that the council and staff at Cordova has been doing. Um, we recently did Cash for College Night, um, a night where we have all the students from all over the district come and uh, work to complete their FAFSA, um, which is the free application for financial aid. Um, we also were able to get the PSAT for free this year at Cordova. Very so good. we had a bunch of students uh, who were able to take that to prepare uh, for the SAT for next year. Um, along with the BSU, myself and uh, the district, we took um, some students over to the, the um, Black College Fair over at El Camino High School. And we were able to get uh, two students got full rides and about six or seven other students got accepted with scholarships. And we look to continue that growth and continue to pursue that next year. Hopefully we can get a higher number of students to come. Um, we also did a tour to Sac State, myself and the Career and Technical Guidance Counselor on campus. Um, we did a tour to Sac State where we got to take the seniors who are applying to Sac State um, to see the campus and get used to you know, that college lifestyle. And we also got to take a tour of the, the new planetarium. I'm a Sac State grad myself, so it was good to show them my old stomping grounds. Um, and next week, we'll be taking a bunch of students to UC Davis on another field trip for the students who are applying there so they can kind of get a feel for that campus. What we really want to do is kind of get the students uh, more uh, engaged in going to college so we can build a college going culture at Cordova High School so that we can start uh, intrinsically motivating students to come in and, and, and get after it in the classroom. We also asked the board to maybe pursue, you know, the ASCA counseling model for the whole entire district so that we can um, bridge the gap between um, social emotional counseling, the counselors and the student body as well as the parents and the community so that we can have a curriculum that starts from elementary all the way through high school in order to make sure that uh, 
our students are not slipping through the cracks and are able to, you know, really be successful. Um, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought that might be a particular interest yep, to you, the PSAT yeah. that was on your things you wanted to see done. Well done. <laughs> um, Paula Bresman. Welcome. Well, thank you. I know you have a lot more important stuff than what I have, and I thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I'm really putting myself out here on the line. I just want you to know that. Okay, so I got two minutes. All right, we need to move forward with much needed change to do some discovery in how a cheer program at the Vista de Lago High School is run. Um, does this district provide stipends? Who makes the decisions? Are the head coaches working together? What is the yearly season budget? Where is the transparency? Why are we constantly being asked to raise money and more money? It appears the JV coach is being pushed out to make way for friends of future coaches in the program. And that JV coach is Kelly Jackson, who is an employee for the Folsom Cordova School District and is a great coach and everybody loves her. Um, we, our financial concerns, the athletic parents are constantly being asked to fundraise. Each fundraiser has a minimum amount requested to fundraise. When is it enough per family to financially fundraise? How can we, um, I'm sorry, how can the program be more transparent with the money? We are never told the itemized amounts needed and how much the fundraisers are made. How do the stipends for the cheer program work? We have two head coaches and three assistant coaches. Do stipends cover these coaches' pay? We don't know. Ethical leadership, verbally criticizing, intimidating, body shaming, excessive displays of favoritisms towards our children and their friends on the squad. Sorry. Extremely controlling, not able to take input from the athletes. Having a varsity captain selected as a cheer for cheer, a cheer captain for only that has only cheered for three years and was responsible for a bullying campaign against a fellow student in middle school. We are losing more valuable players to cheer yearly, not taking advantage of every athlete's skill. Why is this JV assistant coach being more involved in decision making than the head JV coach, Kelly? Girls are constantly giving feedback to the coaches. They've given feedback to the athletic director and to the principal, but still nothing is being done. Why? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that that was very hard for you. Superintendent, can we follow up on yep. her concerns? Paula, if you could leave a copy of the questions with my assistant, that would be helpful. Thank you. And it is concerning about the fundraising. We had dealt with that a few years ago. I want to make sure that our practices are being put into place. Um, Angela? I expected to see Monica, but Angela Merrill, <laughs> welcome. Angela Merrill, um, I am here to talk about the middle school PE dance curriculum. The leader of my family is my mom. The leader of my school is our principal, Mrs. Daniels. The leader of our secondary schools is her assistant superintendent, Mrs. Alleman. The leader of our school district is our superintendent, Mrs. Calligan. Calligan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the leader of our school board is pre board president, Mrs. Ryan King. These women are all successful leaders. Please consider examining and changing the middle school physical education dance segments teaching and assessment requirements. They force students to be male or female, and fe female students have to be followers and not leaders. In PE dance class, males have to be leaders and they have to bow, while the females have to be followers and they have to pretend to lift imaginary skirts and curtsy. We are forced to dance with someone of the opposite gender in this two gender system, and we are judged and graded on following these binary strict rules. This is detrimental to LGBTQ and female students. I want to be a leader, and I want all students to have equal, 
access to leadership opportunities in all facets of our school experience. We can do better. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Superintendent, that actually sounds like maybe a good uh, topic for SAB to um, dive into. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Um, that is the last of the public participation cards. Moving on to reports of district organization, Student Advisory Board. Well, SAB has not met since the last board meeting, so I have no new update except that our next meeting is on November 19th at Sutter Middle School, and I'll definitely bring that topic up at the next meeting. Thank you. California School Employees Association. Welcome. Good evening, school board and superintendent Kaligian. Rob Thomas, uh, chapter president. Wanted to discuss uh, two of the potential budget cut items. Um, today I was at Folsom Lake High School speaking with uh, uh, many of the classified employees there and just wanted to give you um, the input I got. I know that there's been some outreach um, from uh, Superintendent Kaligian and, and others, but I wanted to give you what I heard. Um, there certainly is a deep concern about the future for these classified employees, and it's a very stressful situation for them. Um, there is a need for clarity, and I know that there, you know, there is a decision point here. But um, that was, I heard, I heard that, um, and I think it's important to be sensitive to the needs and challenges of these folks. Um, they've got families to take care of. Um, they've got obligations to meet, and they are just not sure exactly what's going to happen to them. So, um, so they are part of our family, and so we need to keep that in mind in terms of letting them know what's going on and what the next steps are. So, um, the second item is actually on our on our budget to look at for the 2021-22 school year, but I wanted to bring it up now because I'm hoping that we can address it sooner rather than later, um, and that's the print shop. Um, we have two very dedicated printers in the print shop, one of which she's working right now getting, you know, getting the, the prints out. Um, they're very efficient, they're very highly productive, and uh, I we definitely need to look at analyze this and look at this, but I don't see how we're going to save costs by pushing printing to less efficient machines at the sites or trying to to contract it out, which which you're not allowed to do. Um, so, how do we how do we then address the cost issue there? Um, well, they're doing a great job, so we have to look at prioritizing what's going to them because they're going to pr produce it as, as efficiently as possible. So how do we set a, a system in place where the jobs are prioritized in terms of what really needs to be printed? Um, in, we changed the, the cost structure of how we did printing in this district a while back and I think we took out of the system the priority to make sure we are looking at everything we're printing and that it um, whether it needs to be printed or not. Um, I think we don't want to burden the sites with excessive costs, but I think they do need some sort of allowance of what is a reasonable amount that they should be printing, and there should needs to be some sort of marginal cost if they go beyond their allowance. Just like you or me, if something's free, you don't think about it as much. So we need to make sure that Beyond an allowance, there is some marginal cost to the site so that they will be thinking about how the, the cost to the district when they submit those jobs. So I think if we keep that in mind, we can probably deal with this printing issue sooner rather than later just by rethinking how we deal with the, the issue of prioritizing the workflow. So thank you. Thank you. Good crowd tonight. We'll clap. Yeah. Okay. Folsom Cordova Education Association. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Collegian and board members. Um, so, like Rob, I've been working in the past couple of weeks with some of our employee groups 
who've had concerns about what's happening in the budget. Um, they've reached out with their concerns, and I appreciate Dr. Kaligian and Cabinet addressing those quickly and working with the groups to try and find resolution. But I also want to address Folsom Lake directly and just let you know that in meeting with their staff, from day one when they contacted me, it, it's been all about their students. No one ever said, I'm worried about my job. It's what's best for their, their students, students and the best, best learning model for them. So that's where they are coming from and really trying to support that and give those students options so they can succeed. The other group that I really want to take a moment to speak specifically about is our lead teachers. <coughs> they directly support our classrooms. They directly support our students and our teachers in a wide variety of ways. I know they'll be speaking later. I don't want to steal their thunder. but. The, they support us through curriculum, PLCs, social emotional learning, all things that are, mean a lot to the district and all areas that we are focusing on. They're all, their job descriptions are also tied to our LCAP, um, to goals three and four, very strongly. I worry about what will happen, how those goals may have to be realigned if those positions are changed, <clears throat> excuse me, or worse yet, eliminated. Um, again, FCEA maintains that we really want to keep our staffing. We want our cuts as far away from staff and from students as possible moving forward. Um, I know Rhonda has talked about zero budgeting, and I think that's a good way to go. Oh, that's the right term. I think that's a good way, way to, to go, go to, to analyze um, each position and really look at the value of it. I like the way the presentation is set up, too, looking at the pros and cons. Because I think, um, given these tight budget times, we really need to do that with each position and listen to our employee groups, as has been happening, which I think is wonderful, and consider what we'd be losing if any cuts should occur. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. Good evening, Betty Jo Wessinger on behalf of Elena Cabrera. There is no report for FCLA tonight and for DLAC also no report, but she wanted me to let you all know that next month there will be a special presentation on the parent summits. Fabulous, thank you. Thank you. Um, agenda consent? I'll move it. Moved by Mr. Short, I'll second second by Mr. Clark. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so, so just, just so everybody knows, who, if people may have come to the meeting a little late, um, we are now going to move on to our presentation about the boundaries. After the presentation, the board will ask questions, then we'll take it to the public. The next item on the agenda would then, that we have a lot of speakers for, is the um, budget, and we'll get to that after. So just so you know where we are in this program tonight. So with that, Superintendent. Yes, um, before you this evening um, is a very, very extensive, extensive report of the boundary analysis that our facilities department and district staff has worked on and done it in conjunction with our community and family and student and staff input. And before I turn it over to Mr. Washburn, um, our chief operational officer, uh, I wanna thank Matt and his team um, Jerry and Joanne that are sitting in the front row there uh, who have uh, worked tireless hours to really look at all the different scenarios and give us many options to consider. Um, as we look at boundaries, the board has charged the staff with evaluating uh, the, the challenges that we're facing with overcrowding at Vista Del Lago High School. And it's something that's been looked at over time, but we're at a point now with being um, at 1900 where we were at the beginning of the year of having to make, make some, some really, really difficult, difficult decisions as more of the infill housing is coming about and before i turn it over to mr washburn just a little history between our two high schools Folsom high school and vista del lago there's always been enough capacity and still is and will be to seat every one of our incoming um, high school students the issue is on the feeder pattern adjustment, adjustment. And that's what we're talking about this evening. We're trying to create a scenario that allows Vista Del Lago to stay at its optimal or functional capacity, which is anywhere from 1650 to 1750 students, to offer the best education possible, but also realize that that campus was built 
with support facilities for serving a number of that number of students, not 3,000 students like Folsom High School, the support facilities at Vista Del Lago, the restrooms, the cafeteria, the counseling offices, the space for teachers to collaborate, um, the uh, administration building, all of that was built with that number in mind. So if we don't address the the over enrollment issue that we have right now, we, we can't solve what is. And that, that area, that acreage is landlocked. It's not as big as Folsom High's footprint and, and it never will be. So that's something we really need to keep in mind as you listen to this information and listen to the problems that we're trying to solve going into the future. So with that, Mr. Washburn and um, Mr. Thigpen are going to uh, co-deliver this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cleggan and members of the board. Uh, about a year ago, we, uh, as you recall, we came to the board with, a, um, with an issue of having too many students currently at Vista Del Lago and having an over uh, capacity issue. Um, at that time, the board directed staff to come up with registration policies, and then we took the next year basically to, to study the combined capacity issues between the schools, the schools and try to, to balance out the feeder districts, the feeding those schools, and come up with a, a plan that would alleviate the overcrowding um, and the capacity issue at Vista Del Lago. As Dr. Kleegan mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's not a capacity issue. It's an it's a elementary feeder pattern issue. We have planned over the years for enough capacity for the schools. It's the imbalance. We have more residents currently in the Vista Del Lago tenants area than we do at the Folsom High tenants area, yet Vista Del Lago is, has less capacity. So just by the sheer numbers, we have an inherent issue with having too many kids in one feeder district feeding the, the high school. Um, we have made a lot of strides in the past. We have created programs. Um, we have created policies. We have implemented choice and interdistrict policies. We've, we've eliminated a lot of that to try to make sure that we had the resident, many residents possible could attend Vista Del Lago. We rely on choice programs, choice students to choice over to, to Folsom High School to help balance that out but we need to implement policies and uh, policies and procedures in order to try to balance those out as we move forward. So the problems that we're trying to solve, as we mentioned, are balancing enrollment capacity at all the schools for educational excellence. That is our goal, that's what we're doing. We, we're taking the kids in mind, the students, the staff, everybody in the district, and we're trying to do scenarios that work best to provide for the long-term relief at those schools. We need to balance the, the enrollment like I said, the functional capacity, as Dr. Clayton mentioned, is about 1724. Today's enrollment is 1856. It's been as high as 1900. It hovers around there depending on how the class loads work. Well, some highest functional capacity is 2623. We actually are, are building permanent uh, facilities right now. That actually will go up based on some of the permanent facilities that we're building as well. And you can see today's enrollment. So when we started this whole uh, program and journey, we developed a committee and uh, the committee is made up of a lot of district staff, principals, and we had some guiding principles. And those guiding principles you can see were safety, walking distances, geography, transportation, and a big component of that also was community input. That was one of the main things that we wanted to make sure is we had community input as we move forward on this process, and uh, Daniel will be talking about that here in just a second. So tonight, We'll go through this in more detail, but our recommendations tonight are to approve one of the two high school feeder patterns that we have recommended in this report, approve the 2020-21 proposed secondary adjustment of grandfathering school choice. This is, would be an overall grandfathering policy. We would then want to bring back a specific policy related to Vista Del Lago, updating the policy that we currently have this year that we had to implement because of overcrowding at, at Vista Del Lago. So we'd want to bring that back later. And then also a minor adjustment in approving the realignment of the Oak Brook apartment complex in the Twilight Mobile Home Park from Cordoba Villa Elementary School, Mitchell Middle School, Cordoba High to Natoma Station, Sutter and Middle. Uh, we'll talk about that. That is a minor adjustment with very few students. Um, and with that, um, I'll let Daniel will talk about our stakeholder engagement process. Sure. Thank you, Matt. So. 
back up to May. And our objective with our community engagement piece of this project was to certainly gather input, give multiple opportunities for uh, input and for voices to be heard, um, but also to move alongside and work alongside our families and our impacted stakeholders as we um, developed recommendations that we're bringing to you tonight. Um, we wanted to create transparent two-way channels of communication so that we could um, be a sounding board for feedback and also reflect it back on the families that we serve. Um, so this is a snapshot of uh, that in a nutshell. Um, we, through uh, five different surveys, including our families and our students, um, engaged uh, nearly 7,500 people, another 230 people approximately in our public workshops. Uh, and uh, we had other avenues for continuing to provide updates to all of our Folsom families. So we'll back up to May. And uh, this, again, is just a quick snapshot of uh, who participated in our initial survey. And this was a little different as we moved along. But at first, we wanted to start before we proposed any scenarios to um, ask what were some of the priorities that should be considered before we even start um, drawing them and putting them together and drafting them for the public. So this is uh, a compilation of who participated in, in that, that initial survey. survey. Close to 3,600 of our families in Folsom uh, participated. And those guiding principles that Mr. Washburn mentioned earlier were some of the things that we wanted people to rate on a scale of one to five um, were most important to them uh, in the evolution of this process. So certainly safety, on our walking distances and those uh, contiguous boundaries. Um, balancing school size was among the most heavily rated uh, areas of importance for our stakeholders at the initial beginning of this process. Some of the feedback and questions that we received from the beginning, I think you'll see some common threads as we move through some of the input that you received tonight. But but certainly people uh, and our families are wanting to know um, what's the timing of potential impact, um, would there be exceptions? Would there be any kind of phased in implementation? How will we communicate that? And certainly there were some opportunities to work alongside our families and help educate what are some of the factors for consideration as we move along. In August, uh, shortly after school resumed, we um, developed and presented seven initial scenarios, uh, put those forth to the public, uh, and we had about another 1,800 participants in our first thought exchange survey. So I want to show a little bit of a breakdown of uh, what that participation looked like. So when we use these feedback instruments, they are not necessarily um, votes, but they are snapshots of the feedback um, from people who chose to participate in a point of time. So we're going to walk you through the evolution of that um, from the beginning to now. Um, so what we saw uh, when we initially put forth uh, some of these uh, recommendations or these draft recommendations, uh, we saw a lot of um, participation from Folsom Middle School, from Vista del Lago High School, certainly, um, and then the schools that were immediately involved in the um, drafts at that time. Uh, we saw about an even spread uh, in participation uh, in some of the schools that were impacted, with the exception of Blanche Sprints Elementary. Um, you'll see consistently low engagement levels um, throughout this process. So one of the first questions we asked was, if you had to choose right now, what would be among one of your top choices? Um, so this is a snapshot of that, and we'll show you how that evolves as we move along. along. And this is not showing up. Um, I think we had a couple of formatting issues here with the slide, but what we wanted to show you here were some of the common themes that uh, came up through uh, keyword searches and other analysis in this thought exchange. Um, but again, some of the most common themes that we were seeing were um, what is the timing of the impact going to be and what exceptions might uh, you adopt through policy before we implement any change, regardless of what that looks like. Um, and so uh, staff has worked hard to craft um, both scenarios that help reach the goals that are responsive to the feedback and also help answer some of those questions for our families. Uh, we held our first uh, public forum on September 19th. Um, we heard some very common themes, particularly on that middle to high school continuum. Um, we heard a lot about that phased in implementation. Uh, and given that some of the scenarios did not include uh, a continuum, we, uh, and we have, uh, at least on one scenario before you tonight, um, some students breaking from a traditional feeder pattern um, from Folsom Middle to Folsom High School, we had a lot of questions about what type of social and emotional supports for those transitions at a critical time might we help provide. Um, so we wanted to reflect that here and, and show that that is something that is uh, a part of the consideration. Um, we held another, uh, we, we revised our drafts uh, and brought back uh, different scenarios um, on October 3rd for our next public workshop. Um, 
and uh, some that showed uh, a continuum from middle to high school and some that did not have that. Uh, and we did a live thought exchange during that process. Um, we had about 120, 127 people there, primarily um, Folsom Hills Elementary families and some Blanche Sprints families. Uh, and uh, again, as we moved closer in the decision making process and in this um, collaborative process with our families, uh, we again started to see um, some feedback and some suggestions around not just um, what will exemptions look like in a phased in implementation look like, but here are some suggestions for what we think you should do to help soften the landing for our families. Um, because not everyone could participate in that public forum, we sent this out to all of our Folsom families um, to try to provide equitable, equitable access, access to this information. We had another 751 participants during the 10-day period that we distributed this additional um, thought exchange uh, survey. Um, and we saw a little bit of different representation in our groups um, that participated and identified uh, which, with which schools their children were attending, primarily from Folsom Hills Elementary, um, again, a small percentage from Blanche Sprints Elementary, um, and a significant portion from Folsom Middle School. And so uh, I show that um, because, again, we wanted to see a snapshot in time as the um, scenarios were evolving um, and people chose to participate in the engagement process. Where did we see support for um, different scenarios evolve? Um, so we saw one outlier um, in a pretty even spread among the other options. So some of the feedback and common themes that we started to see um, began to evolve as well. Um, we saw certainly some of the same feedback and common trends that you saw earlier uh, in the school year, but we saw a lot more highly rated comments and common themes related to um, who is actually attending Vista Del Lago High School and who is taking up space for resident students. Um, there uh, certainly um, was uh, a lot of feedback related to interdistrict transfers, um, school choice. Um, so we thought this would be a good opportunity to show what that trend has been in the last few years as we have severely restricted transfers into the school from outside of the district and also school choice from within the district. Um, so you'll see a pretty sharp drop uh, in the last couple of years since the board adopted the registration policy of the Lago High School and we expect to see that trend continue downward. In October 29th and October 30th, um, we did survey our students. Um, the district chose to um, focus and target uh, our students who were most directly connected to the potential impacts of the scenarios that were being developed in collaboration with our families. Um, so we asked our fifth graders at Blanche Sprints Elementary and Folsom Hills Elementary with the help of our teachers and our staff at those schools. Um, very quick uh, and simple survey. We worked with the teachers to have prompts to help explain the purpose of the survey. Um, and we had pretty good participation rate um, in that it was optional and anonymous. Um, just shy of 60% of our fifth graders at both of the schools. And we asked them a few things based on some of the feedback we were hearing through this public outreach process related to what was important to our households. Um, so we wanted to ask them what kind of feelings do they have about this proposal that they're hearing about to potentially redirect them to Folsom High School. And what you'll see is some fairly mixed responses. Um, about 41% said they're okay with it regardless of which middle school they attend. Um, and another uh, 20, 21% said they're actually not sure. Um, a significant portion uh, uh, wrote in, uh, about 16% said um, that they really want to go to Vista Del Lago High School. Um, while another 16%, about an equal amount, said they're okay going to Folsom High, but they'd like to go to Sutter Middle first. When we asked them uh, how they uh, rate their agreement with staying with their same cohort of friends um, or going, going to the same, same school as their older sibling, again, you'll see um, some strong opinions, certainly, about the, ele the, the, um, the relationships that they built in elementary school. About a quarter, more than a quarter of them are actually not sure how they feel about that. Um, and then when we asked them about going to the same school as their older sibling, um, and again, uh, I think it was about 50 or 60 percent uh, should be in the rationale. Um, actually didn't have an older sibling that was attending high school that took this survey, but of those that answered this question, about 42 percent of them were um, not sure how they felt about that. Um, we did survey all 6th through 7th, 6th uh, uh, through 8th graders at Folsom Middle School, but we also were able to extract the data for students who self-reported that they attended Blanche Sprints Elementary or Folsom Hills Elementary to make the data as relevant as possible for you. Um, so we asked them some very similar questions. We had about 274 students, or about 24% that said they had attended those schools. Um, so, so when, when we, we asked them those same questions, um, you, start, you started to see some of the similar trends, but a little bit wider of a spread. Um, as they continue to develop those relationships to consider their future path. We also 
asked all students, um, because this has been a topic of conversation related to um, what's the level of awareness or open-mindedness among students um, related to the programs and opportunities that are afforded them at Folsom High School as well. Um, so we wanted to gauge their interest in um, how they might like to learn more. Um, so we had a lot of uh, indicators here to show that there was some willingness to learn a little bit more. Um, we had about 100 students out of our 1,100 uh, that wrote in that um, they're not interested in learning more at Folsom High School, um, while uh, a, a number, a significant number of our students, around 600, 500, another 400, said they'd um, like to tour the campus, visit the programs, and learn a little bit more about what Folsom High School might have to offer. So I'm going to hand it back over to Mr. Washburn to talk about how um, we're trying to marry some of that feedback with um, scenarios to help meet our enrollment goals. So after a lot of uh, um, analysis, uh, we spent a lot of time, the committee, we did you know, the, the projections, we did a lot of work on demography, we did the thought exchange, we did the surveys, so we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, staff worked together to narrow the initial seven scenarios down to two scenarios that we thought would work as far as a scenario moving forward for the board to consider. So the first scenario that we have is um, scenario 2A, which, which we call it, um, is Folsom Hills Elementary School via Sutter to Folsom High School. Um, this is one of the scenarios we, we heard a lot of the thought exchange. We heard a lot of the survey, a lot of the, the community forum comments about maintaining con a continuum through from the feeder patterns, all the way from the elementary to the middle to the high school. Um, as we have discussed, one of the issues we have is we have two middle schools of the same size, but yet we have high schools of different size. So it's difficult having that same feeder pattern moving from middle school through to high school. Of all the continuum patterns, this is, is the one that we determined that would be feasible, most feasible that could, that could work. Um, just kind of going through, and now I wanna, one thing I wanna point out is this is projecting resident students. So if you're looking at actual enrollment, it's not gonna be exact because we have to take resident students from there is where you implement various choice policies and things like that. So at the top, as you can see, the first, what we did is we took uh, the projected resident students and we, we have, you can see the functional capacity, the optimal capacity. Functional capacity assumes somewhere around 50% hot seating. Hot seating is where uh, teachers don't have a prep period. So they have to have somewhere else to go. So this, as I mentioned, excludes choice and interdistrict transfers. So th what we did is we, we looked, looked at, at what this would do to both Vista del Lago and Folsom High School, and we looked at from you know starting now up until the next up till 2028. As you can see, it brings Vista del Lago down to its functional capacity, but it does take a few years to get to that point. Uh, Folsom High can easily uh, um, accommodate all of those students. One of the issues that it does do is it does create an imbalance at the middle schools. As you can see, we have about almost 400 students difference. As you can see in some of these numbers here, 1,100 something at Folsom Middle, and we have about 15 plus at Sutter Middle. So it does create an imbalance. Obviously, there would be some choice opportunities to choice back to Folsom Middle for those students who may want to do that. Um, one thing I want to point out is these numbers do not include any grandfathering. So any grandfathering policy would only increase these numbers to a higher amount and it would just make that move out a little bit further down the road. What we did to try to reconsider to soften the blow, so to speak, instead of having, you know, we we're, say we would do a grandfathering of eighth grade is what we kind of implemented as, as a policy we're, we're recommending. But rather than just stopping in eighth grade, we would do a phased implementation. So basically, we would cap it at 50, we'd go down 50 students per year, So which, oops, sorry, which you can see on this side. So we have, right here is where we're at right now. We would maintain that for next year, the next school year, because we would grandfather the eighth graders in. So we'd maintain the same scenario, the same number of students, same capacity that we have currently at Vista Del Lago. Then we would limit the number of ninth graders coming in so that we would have a cap of 1,800 to 1,850. So instead of just saying a hard cap of functional capacity of 1,724 or somewhere in that range, we would take a few years to get to that point, 
allowing more students to be able the opportunity to choice back in to Vista del Lago for those who may want to do it. So what that is, it, it softens it as it moves down the phase implementation. As you can see, it's 50 kids per year until we get down to about the phase, the, the functional capacity number, which doesn't happen in, until at least five plus years. So this doesn't get us to the point that we would like to be at Vista. It does take a while, but it is one of the uh, continuum approaches that would begin to start decreasing the number of students and the capacity at Vista del Lago. So that's, that's one of the recommendations that we had moving forward. Some of the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages, it creates a continuum. continuum. So, so we yeah. have the feeder pattern going from the elementary to the middle of the high school. It uh, would start allowing some, some choice into Vista del Lago. It might increase that, but it would be very, very limited. Um, and it would probably decrease some of the hot seating, which could be seen along the way to allow some of those teachers to be back in their classrooms. Um, all, for all periods. Uh, some of the, the disadvantages, it would take over five years for Vista Lago to reach the functional capacity and possibly allowing for more choice back in. Um, it does, as I mentioned, create an imbalance at the middle school. You have more students at uh, Sutter than you do at uh, Folsom Middle. So we would probably want to institute a registration priority process at Sutter just in case that would be necessary. Um, as, as I, I mentioned, mentioned, there would be space at Folsom Middle for students who would want a choice back in. And it doesn't fully address the number of 912 students of Vista Lago area for over five years to get down to that functional capacity number that we were talking about. The next scenario we have is uh, what we call scenario number three. And this is the Blanche Sprints attendance area moving and Folsom Hills attendance area moving from Folsom Middle and then to Folsom High School. This scenario, kind of the same, um, it actually, because there's more students, we're talking Folsom Hills and we're talking Blanche Sprints, it reaches that functional capacity number much sooner. As you can see in here, the numbers go down and reaches functional capacity almost right from the beginning. Um, obviously, this doesn't include grandfathering policy, so those numbers would be a little bit higher. And it also, Folsom High maintains also below its functional capacity. So it works at both schools. It, what it also does is it allows for choice almost immediately back to Vista del Lago from anybody of those attendance areas, Blanche Sprints or Folsom Hills, who may want to attend, continue Vista del Lago, it would allow choice back into those schools. It also, it allows, it's, it keeps a, more of a balance at the middle schools. As you can see, the middle schools are more balanced between Folsom Middle and Sutter. There could be some choice either way back, and that if there are some of the parents who may want continuum for their students or students who may want continuum, there would be some choice opportunities for that as well under this scenario. This is the phase implementation. We would do the same thing here. We would grandfather in the eighth graders and then do a phased implementation with 50 students at a time coming down and we would allow those students to come in. As you can see, within two years, we have already reached our uh, functional capacity. So functional capacity is reached within two years on this scenario. So as a much, greater impact and a much better relief faster at Vista del Lago. Advantages and disadvantages, Vista del Lago resident students uh, would decrease the near optimal well, capacity, capacity or, or functional capacity. Teacher hot seating could eventually be eliminated and then allows for school choice into Vista del Lago, like I mentioned back in for those students who may wanna go back to Vista del Lago or continue. The disadvantages as it is it realigns high school attendance banner for two elementary schools. So now you have two elementary schools that are affected by that. And Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills would not have a continuum from middle to high school unless there was space available for choice um, at the middle school. The, uh, the other, uh, what we have on the agenda for recommendation, as I mentioned, is a proposed uh, grandfathering policy um, I kind of mentioned some of the, the things about this is that we would allow the 19, 20, 20 students to finish their career at their current school. We would grandfather in eighth graders based on space availability. Uh, last year, um, all of the students who registered by the registration deadline got into VISTA. Some after that point were redirected after that, but by the registration deadline, those students were, were able to come in. We talked about eliminating the dual enrollment it would really be just a choice policy, the dual enrollment at Vista or at Folsom Hills and um, Blanche Sprints. And then um, 
as I mentioned, eighth graders would be admitted on a space available, but as I mentioned last year, they were all accepted if they met the registration deadline. It would just be depending on how many uh, decided to choice and how much space available, but we anticipate that pretty much most all of them would be able to attend. And, and siblings, siblings would receive the uh, CHOP choice priority. And as I mentioned, depending on the scenario, we would come back with Vista del Lago specific um, registration policies that would be specific like we did this year at Vista del Lago. The other uh, minor change that we talked about was moving um, the Oak Brook apartment complex off of Folsom Boulevard in the Twilight Mobile Home Park from um, Cordoba Villa, Mitchell, and Cordoba High to Natoma Station, Sutter, and Folsom High School. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, only affects 24 students in the complex. Four at uh, Mobile Home Park of those four students, actually two of them already attend the STEM Academy at Riverview. One's a special ed student, go to Navigator, and one of them is a Mitchell Middle School student. So um, that is a minor student. That What that does is it creates much better efficiencies in transportation. Currently, they are transporting those students all the way down to Cordoba Villa. Uh, this would actually be a money-saving opportunity. It's better for the students. They're not on the, on the bus as long. Uh, they're more closer to the uh, Folsom community, and it's, uh, it's, it's better for the students as well. So with that, that, that is our, our presentation and our recommendations. Okay, so um, we're going to go to board questions now, but I want to reassure the public here that the board has been receiving your emails, and we have been reading them, and I, I'm confident that the board members have on their minds what are priorities to you. So as we ask questions about this presentation, perhaps we can um, clear some concerns, maybe ease some anxiety. So as we work through this process, listen uh, to where the discussion is going, and then we'll open it up to the public okay mr reed can i ask a procedural question yeah. do you mind dave yeah, go ahead. uh is there is it possible to split the uh motions and take up the mobile home park to transitions get, get uh, first and then move to the other boundary discussion is that possible yes it's probably a good idea we're going to lose sight of that one so is there anyone from the public who wants to speak about that i didn't see any cards okay is there any board members that have questions about the realignment for the elementary. I'm actually good with that. I, I'd move to, to approve, approve that change. change. I'll second. So moved by Mr. Hoover, second by Mr. Reed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Very good move there. So moving to questions of the board from the board about the presentation. Mr. Reed. Thank you. So um, actually, I'm going to save uh, my questions uh, for after the, the, the my colleagues uh, speak and the, the public policy. speaks, but I want to share my um, observations, I guess I'll call them right now. Um, and, and first of all, I want to thank staff. I mean, this is a lot of material you've provided us, um, a whole lot of material um, from uh, the public um, sessions to the um, app-based uh, uh, surveys. Uh, as well as the, the materials that you've provided for for this meeting, um, and you know the one thing that that uh, I observed and I and I really appreciated it was uh, that the, the district boundary committee had some guiding principles: um, safety, walking distances, transportation, geographic features, and community input. And it occurred to me as I was trying to digest all this material that um, to, to, to absorb it all, I wanted to figure out what my guiding principles were. Um, and I, I came up with four. Uh, the first was choose the least disruptive option. The second was do not create a population crisis in another school as a way to alleviate Vista del Lago capacity issues. Uh, the third is um, in, in my mind, the importance uh, of grandfathering all current sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students in their current high school trajectory, uh, which includes no phasing requirements, no school choice requirements, and a guaranteed spot if they re re enroll on time. Uh, and then the fourth is uh, maintain a unified elementary, middle school, high school um, feeder pattern. And uh, based on those four guiding principles, uh, I personally do not feel I can support either scenario 2A or 3, 
that comprise the staff recommendation. Although, although I'd be um, welcome uh, to hear arguments uh, uh, to the contrary. Uh, but I do recognize the problem um, uh, and, and believe it would be irresponsible for the board not to um, uh, do nothing and hope for the best. Uh, the board tried that in the past and it's the reason why we're, we're here today. Um, but out of the 10 scenarios, uh, um, I think you mentioned seven, but some of them had A or A. So out of the 10 scenarios uh, analyzed by staff and, and subject to community f uh, feedback, really the only scenario uh, that I saw that met the guiding principles that I just described was option 1A. Um, uh, now I know folks will say it, it doesn't create enough of a population shift, um, but I, I think I would respectfully disagree on that. I think it would be in fact just right, um, as uh, it is the only shift that does not in, create in what I consider a stress uh, stressing point at uh, Sutter Middle School. Um, but if if but if we don't think it is enough, you know, I, I would welcome an aggressive marketing campaign for for Folsom High School. Um, right now, at least uh, based on the numbers you had um, or that was shared in the documentation, that apparently approximately three hundred students from the Vista del Lago uh, boundaries already are over at Folsom High School. Now, I, I understand that a majority of them is by choice. H however, there are obviously several that are there because um, of capacity issues at Vista del Lago. But I think between those two modest steps, one is taking a, a, a smaller high school that would produce less of um, a dramatic impact on, on Sutter Middle School combined with a marketing uh, program for um, Folsom High School that would be targeted to Folsom Middle School students and parents, I think we could potentially achieve uh, the same objective that um, perhaps uh, the, the two uh, proposals that you know, were, were brought forth does. So those are my observations. I'll save my questions for afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoover, do you have any questions? Sure. Thank you, Matt. Um, and Daniel. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so just off the bat here, uh, and I think you might have just said it, but just I want to get, get it out there. there. Uh, what percentage of the current VISTA eligible students um, choose to attend a different school? Uh, so choice out, essentially. I believe it's like 20% or something like that. Yeah. I, I, 20%, okay. I don't have exactly, but yeah. it's something. But like yeah, that. approximately. Okay. Um, and would you say that it would be safe to assume that this percentage, I, I guess, you know, would it be similar uh, as the resident numbers that you showed, resident enrollment numbers uh, grow, that this percent, barring any marketing changes, would stay consistent? I, or one, has it? Stayed, one could assume. I don't know that. That's yeah. Or has it, has it stayed consistent over the last? I would have to look and see. I mean, it's, I think it probably has main a, maintained a consistency, but I, I okay. I can't verify that for sure. I know we can't tell the future, obviously, but um, just just curious uh, if there's a current trend we can look at. Um, so if I'm reading the numbers correctly. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be reading them wrong, but there appears to be kind of a peak in 2021 in our resident enrollment numbers. Yes, uh, we do have a peak, and then we will start having a decline. decline. Okay. Um, it is a few years, but you understand it's working its way through, so the secondary level right. is feeding that crunch. We will have some infill, but yes, there will be. There's still over 2,000 residents within that Vista del Lago for a, a few more years to go. Okay. Um, so, and that that peak includes the projected development in the yes in the area, correct? Okay. Yes, it does. Um, so, uh, given given those projections, would you say that we can likely expect an enrollment decline once everything is developed, like eventually, uh, given kind of how the numbers look at the moment? Eventually, five to six years down the road, we will probably start seeing some decline. We are seeing it at the beginning elementary level where the birth rates are down. It will take a while for that to work through, considering the 
infill adjustments, it will be a slower process. Okay. But, um, it, it will take probably, I don't know, five to seven years before we might start seeing some of that. Okay. Just a rough estimate. Um, just kind of shifting gears, um, the current, uh, and I don't know if this is the best question for Matt or someone else, but what is the current process for families who live in the dual enrollment communities to choose the middle and high school uh, that they would like to attend? I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I think they just have the choice. I, I'm not sure. We can have uh, Mr. Yeah. Wilson address that, please. I, I believe the last process about two years ago, a form was sent out to the people living in the dual enrollment zones that asked them to identify their middle schools and high schools. I'm looking to the experts who filled out the forms. Uh, but I believe that was the process in the past few years. Prior to that, no documentation was required. They simply <laughs> enrolled in um, either the middle school or, or the high school when they got to that point okay do you know if there's a default school or is there in the dual enrollment zone um no there is not a next school automatically selected at that time um so if you don't fill out the paperwork what we have to ask the parents okay what middle school are you going to or what high school are you going to um oftentimes once you pick the middle school it right. does align to your sure. high school sure. uh, but from the fifth grade okay. to the sixth grade they were um, identifying that as of two years ago on a piece of paper. Okay. So given that, um, does anyone know? And if not, you know, uh, happy, happy to, to get, get this afterwards. But uh, what percentage of the students in the dual enrollment zone currently attend Vista del Lago? I just it's confirmed. confirmed about, about 40%. 40. <laughs> okay. And so, and the other 60? Um, choose Folsom High School. In, in the dual enrollment in zone? In the dual apparently. enrollment zone, correct. And, all right. And then, uh, kind of my last question, it's, it's a little more procedural and is, is honestly, I think, um, reflection of some of the frustrations uh, as a board member here. But is there a reason that one or two of the board members were not invited to be on the boundary committee? It, was there some sort of uh, legal or procedural barrier to that uh, just out of curiosity if uh... actually we were meeting with our principals at the time okay. um, and getting their feedback and before we rolled things out to the board which uh -huh. we did we rolled it out to all of the board before we right. had community right. forums so we, okay. um, we had several meetings and okay. Okay. and chose okay. to do it that way, getting our principals input. And we had all of our elementary principals on the Folsom side and middle school and high school, so okay. it's pretty time intensive. Uh, um, I will, uh, I'll stop there for now. I might have some follow-up, but. I just want to, your yep. enrollment projection, I just want to say we do project about over 2,000 students clear up till 2028, so that it's pretty stable all the way okay. through. Just, so, so it just stays kind of the. State, and then it starts going slightly down. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so. We had meetings last year, correct, on uh, registration policy, excuse me. Um, and we formed the committee you had mentioned that we did. Um, how many people were on that committee? And this may be kind of a follow up to Josh, um, Mr. Hoover's question, but how many people were on that committee? Well, we probably at least 15. We had the high school principals, we had the middle school principals, the affected elementary principals. We had uh, all the instructional leaders, uh, Dr. Kligian, myself, uh, Rhonda participating some, my staff, Jerry and Joanne. So there was uh, anywhere, you know, at least a good 15 plus people, Daniel and staff. So. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is we knew that this capacity issue was going to come to a head last year, correct? Mm -hmm. How come we didn't jump on this train earlier and maybe have some parents as part of that committee for providing some input and maybe some data that maybe we're missing? I'm um, just curious of how come we didn't, and we knew it was coming, but how can we just, you know, invited a few parents or at least got the message out? Well, we knew there was an issue way before that. That's why we talked about early on and that's why we had the registration policy right. to give us a year to study it I think the idea was to let staff the principals kind of the conduit the principals being a conduit through 
their staff and their community and their environment, which would include their parents getting input and uh, from there coming up with different scenarios and information that we could then put out to the public mm -hmm. to let them comment on. I think you get a good cross-section that way. Having a committee with having a good cross-section with all the affected would sometimes become too big, and when you have too big of a committee, then it's kind of hard to be successful in, in providing accurate or, or good information that you're going to get out and at least present to the public. Yeah, I just, I just think it's kind of weird that all of a sudden now we have this, this issue in what, uh, three, four months ago, we decided to have town hall meetings, two of them to be exact, and knowing that we had to make a decision today, and I'm not sure if, if there will be a decision today, but I'm thinking that maybe we should have had more. Maybe we should have started last year. Maybe we should have started this process a little earlier. You know what I'm saying? Well, as we recall we did. We did a survey last spring, and I, Dan might want to we did actually do a survey last spring and we did start on that and there, there is thousands of hours of research and you know, stuff that goes into this it's it's not something you would just put out right away we had a plan right we had a schedule and we had a timeline that we are currently working on and i think we've met so okay. Okay, Dan, you wanna... yeah i just wanted to add to what mr washburn um added you'll recall that um i think it was around october of last year um, when we were taking a look at this issue and revisiting the issue as that had developed since 2010. Um, we heard loud and clear from our families during the forums at a board of education meetings that they needed some time to plan and have opportunities for input and two-way communication. Mm -hmm. So we designed a comprehensive process for that, in which we engaged nearly 8,000 people, um, including 270 people face-to-face, -face, um, not counting in, in those, those numbers, numbers um, what our principals on the ground were able to do in FaceTime and the relationships that they built and carry that information back to our committee. So there are a number of successful models and how you engage the publics um, that are impacted by these decisions. Um, I think taking six months and engaging nearly 8,000 families was an opportunity to create open, transparent channels of communication. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm going to make some references probably uh, from our 2019 attendance boundary uh, report that hopefully we can answer those things. Um, I know that we talked about maybe, how can I say this? Exploring an education pathway that will encourage elementary students to maybe consider Folsom High School. Uh, my question would be, what was done to encourage those students to attend Folsom High School? Was there anything at all? Anything that we could attract those students? Maybe the CTE program? Well, there's we can do now, and we did do that back uh, in uh, 2010, actually, when we did the, the one of the proposals brought to the board and it was directed to market those programs and that was done. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the foreign language program at that point. We did a continuum from Folsom Hills to Sutter to so they would be a route to going to Folsom High School. Uh, we had some visual and performing arts pathway program. We enhanced the STEM program as a pathway through. Um, we did any many programs we could. There was some outreach between uh, Folsom High and some of the feeder programs. Um, and then some of the choice policies. A lot of that did lead to more choice students attending st uh, Folsom High from Vista del Lago. What was the percentage of that? Well, isn't it turned out? I, I mean, it, it gradually increased. Probably, I, I'm thinking it's around 20 percent. I, you know, that's where that 300 plus students has come from, is choice. And a lot of that is program. I mean, a lot of it's you know music programs, things like that, different okay. things that you know attract some of those students. I mean, some students come back to come to Vista from Folsom. It's obviously it's a lot more going the other way, and that's the only way it's really worked is because of those many that many students choosing from Vista to Folsom. Okay. So I'm, obviously, there's new programs now, so you know a different approach would have to be taken as far as marketing. Okay, I will have extra questions later on after comments. Mr. Short. Uh, thank you. And I, I just first, first wanted, wanted to say, say um, I want to put my hats off to the staff and the community doing a really good job of creating a transparent process. When I was seeing all that in the meetings and everything, it, it reflects back, this is not the first boundary adjustments we've seen, closures of school sites. And when I was thinking about it, I said, well, what is the difference? The real difference is we, we got the information out there. We have the analysis. We have a lot of data. 
And from the history I've looked at other ones, we're dealing with a nonlinear analysis. That meaning that you're going to have, there is no straight silver bullet. There is no linear way from point A to point B. Uh, all the past when we did boundary changes, there's going to be transitional impacts. There's going to be hard decisions we have to make. But all in all, we've made those decisions in the past, and it seems like we've adjusted to them. And when I was sitting on the design committee for the Vista de Lago, I think there's a little history that you have to understand the capacity of facilities, like the superintendent was talking about. We have, when we were designing that thing, we, it's, it's like in the fee the analysis, analysis, when you look at that, the numbers, and I know it's, it's all numbers, there's predictions on the demographics and the growth, and we've seen declines in enrollments in some parts of our district, and then suddenly they're back. Uh, the economy goes out and goes back down. The transition of real estate going in and out. So these are just not numbers that we can predict completely. They're just trends and projections that we try to do our best over the years. So we found ourselves at Vista de Lago uh, having that upward uh, number at a, because of the economy, uh, how Folsom, the city, everybody wants to live there. It's great. It's great news that we have impacted schools because back in the day when we were talking about it, we were saying, let's build something that everybody will come and see and make a great district. And we are there. But also it comes with problems, growth problems, and the capacity issues. When you, when you, you, when you look at the design of a, si a facility, there's that capacity. There are in environmental impacts like overage of a parking. These are things that we worked with the city along with. Uh, effluent, if you have overcapacity, it, it, you're, you're in violation of the affluent uh, permits for cities. You're putting too much sewer into there. I mean, so there's a lot of impacts. My question is, are there costs and are there also impacts? If we stay, keep growing and impacting, is there any repercussions for us to say if we went to 3,000 and started building out and it, we're overpacked and there could be uh, fire marshal issues or could be uh, environmental impact issues, we need to stay within that design capacity as best as possible is that correct yeah I, I mean like any facility you build it within a your structure is built your infrastructure is built mm -hmm. around a certain capacity and then you have a certain amount of overage. Over. once, once you, you get, get past that capacity number then you start affecting your infrastructure dr Cleegan went through some of those earlier i mean you have restroom issues you have staffing issues you have parking issues um, some will say it could lead to you know the students being more unruly because there's more students passing in through certain areas um, you uh, have areas that you you know you might have to expand sidewalks, walkways, right. pace, things like that. Um, obviously, we know about the parking issues. Uh, there are obviously issues that come with capacity on your infrastructure that, that do tax that. Yes. Yeah, you have a higher occupant load. It, it impacts even ADA and other areas that you can get sued on uh, uh, fixture counts and bathrooms. So when you have li larger Absolutely. numbers, so it puts us at liability. So with that said. I just want the board to understand there are impacts that are beyond what we're going to, it costs us money down the road and potential risks other than the unfortunate overgrowth that we have, which creates problems. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the, the, um, the down the road costs. Um, like if we have too many uh, uh, folks on a site and our contracts with our employees, I mean, if we if we go over and we do things, then then we have issues also with our contracts. Is that correct? Because if you have too many students in a school site, then how do you facilitate? I think we'd have to stay within our contract. Right, we have to stay in our contract, so you have to expand. But we can't do modules and uh, modulars at Vista because that is landlocked, like the superintendent said, and it wasn't designed for that type of things. So at the time, we we have an imbalance here, and the problem right now is we have the two feeders that are unbalanced, and we just could not get our wraps around that and we did boundaries adjustments before so my you know so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, that the impacts are huge here and then if we don't try to fix the problem somewhere down the road we're gonna find ourselves in bigger problems down the road not addressing the capacity issues so my question was about the capacity and the infrastructure so at this point okay yeah thank you yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask questions to maybe try to see if, if I, can I can get, get some, some sort of head nodding or something from the board to see if we can get some sort of uh, consensus about some of the concerns from the community. Okay, um, my I think I think we all agree that we have a problem when we have to fix it, and I've been saying from the get go that we need to figure out how to have as soft a landing as possible for this. 
So first off, um, your numbers that you give that you've given us are residents within that area, and you confirmed it would be people moving into the Vista area, correct? Right. Though those people who move into the Vista area after we make this change, I'm. It may sound bad, but my concern is the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at Folsom Middle. So if we can put signs out in front of elementary schools that say this school is impacted, your student may be redirected to another high school. I mean, that is the first thing I think we should be doing, is protecting the ones that we have in the school and the people coming in later and the people coming into the apartments especially should be told that you may be routed to Folsom High School. The, sh the expectation should be you are going to Folsom High School. So that's my first somewhat comment, not question, but I want to know if we can do that. Um, one of the things that's of concern to the community is that they want reassurances that the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders can get in to Vista Del Lago. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could possibly maneuver some sort of a solution to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have the enrollment at Vista at 1900, and it's not optimal, but it's functioning. Um, parking is kind of been quieted a little bit. I don't even want to go with parking here, but we've um, allowed 1900 into there. Um, if we were to keep that capacity for the next three years, could we put something in the school, uh, this, the school choice paper to assure the families of the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders that they could get into Vista Del Lago? Uh, if you're asking me that, I, I mean, I think there could, there would have to be. Let me put it this way. Could the board tell you that we want to cap Vista Del Lago's <laughs> enrollment at 1900 and assure that the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at Folsom Middle, if we redirect Blanche, I don't want to make this too complicated. If we redirect one or two of the schools, if the board agrees, I'm going to use an example. If we were to say Folsom Hills and Blanche Sprints would go to Folsom Middle with a school choice into Sutter, and then on to Folsom High. And we were to say we want to keep the enrollment at Vista at 1900, and we want to assure this, that the students impacted by that change at Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills would get into Vista Del Lago. And to me, that falls back on, they have priority out of people, people moving into that area. So is that something if You're the board doesn't- Keeping yeah. them all at the Vista Del Lago, not moving anybody. At, for three years. Three years. The incoming fifth graders, all right, the fifth graders now that would be going into middle school from Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills would be going to Folsom High. By that time, there could be school choice open at Vista. My concern right now is the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders right there. Could What we're doing is instead of getting it down by 50, 50, 50 over three years, we're waiting three years to have the drop. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it, it, it could be even more than that. I would think that very, very strict and defined registration policies would have to be determined because there's a lot of caveats in there. Mm -hmm. the residents moving in. Yeah. What if a resident who currently lives there moves out and they want to finish their 12th grade there? I mean, we got a lot they, of these. No, then they moved out of the, They kind of get a lot out. of these. But I would, I, I could, we've gone through that. I would not recommend that. that we would have language that says you are assured. We can never guarantee because everything, everything is based, based on, on space, space availability. There are times, there's certain class numbers coming in that there probably will be some students who may not get in. And there maybe have to be a policy in place to say, okay, for those few students who don't get in, what is that policy? Is there a lottery? Is there a, most of them would get in? Yes. But, but you, I, we couldn't right assure that they would all we get have, in. We have the deadline. Um, we have a marketing we have uh, the opportunity for Folsom Middle School students to learn about Folsom High School. We have changes going on at Folsom High School that's going to draw people to Folsom High with the manufacturing program. Um, I'm trying to soften the landing a little <laughs> bit and um, see what might happen in the three years and not possibly have the anxiety of these sixth, seventh, and eighth graders not knowing if they're going to, you know, get into Vista. That's one of the reasons why we had the implement, you know, phase implementation to try to help ease that a little bit to allow some choice back in um, you know it's always challenging when you're relying on choice programs to balance it that's kind of what we have been doing um, it you know we would have to like I say the, the choice policies would have to be written very carefully and very specifically 
and it would have to still have the caveat, I think, of space availability because there's never a guarantee that every student who's attending those schools who wants to attend could attend. There could be some that may not make it in. Obviously, over time, then, you know, if, if those programs work, that, that would help, but I, I don't think you could guarantee I, that. But I see part of our problem is the new development, that we're projecting this new development that is going to cause the numbers to keep going up. But if we're just protecting our our numbers now, I think with our normal rate of attrition over to Folsom High. I know nobody wants to put that stamp that yes, we will get it done, but what we did this year, I think we could do the next couple of years and get those students in there and then have the, uh, the, um, the change officially take effect with the incoming sixth graders next year, the current fifth graders. Mm -hmm. That they will know now that if they're at Blanche Sprints or Folsom Hills, that they could end up, they would, they are assigned to Folsom Hills, and their acceptance into Vista is based on space uh, availability. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, that's. I'm just sharing those questions if that's possible, because that's where I'm at right now. Because that's the way that I see the softest landing on this for. Um, right. Our it, I, it, I mean, it is obviously anything's possible. Staff will, will work with whatever we can. I just have to caution that there's kids who probably would not get in. Obviously, most would get in. It's the registration policies when instructional staff and everybody has to deal with all those situations. They would need very clear guidelines to know exactly who gets in and who isn't. And then it has to be enforced. Mm -hmm. Because, oh. you know, you, you hear the stories and then, well, you know, certain well, I'm gonna get in. Well, I'm going to so compliment it, Vista because I think they've done a good job this year in trying to weed out um, the. So. Um, and, and if I can add, if board directs staff to um, make, you know, that softer landing and grandfather grades six, seven, and eight um, and, and keep, keep a capacity, capacity of 1,900, I think we can work with that. But we need to know the flip side of that coin, which is new residents who are building homes across from Vista del Lago may not be able to send their children there. And just like you mentioned, at our elementaries, we say if we're at capacity, um, you know, there's a, a chance you can be... Uh, rerouted to a different school that hasn't been our culture but I mean it would have to be something that we're all in agreement and, and willing to stand and enforce and when we realtors come in and they're selling homes across the street from Vista we have to communicate with them as well we just need to know the flip side of that and when it, when people move into my neighborhood there's some, yeah it, there's a possibility of time that they weren't going to get into Oak Chan they just need to know that um, I'm just saying I, I I'm not happy with those two proposals. I think there's a, a, a better, in my pref that's my preference, to soften the landing like that. So, I, I'm t we have a lot of people who want to speak to this. So I'm going to try to get a feel if there's any consensus with the board if they want to explore that idea because I kind of think that that might calm a lot of the fears sure. or... Um, is there any consent? Yeah, Ms. Ranking, I, I um, would be in favor of doing a, a sixth, seventh, and eighth grandfathering with specific criteria that I presume would have to be adopted at another meeting um, on uh, uh, once we hit the 1900 uh, cap. So uh, at least I agree with you on that, yes. Is there any other... Um, board members who might be inclined to consider that or if you have um, another suggestion you want to um, throw out or? well i mean i was going to save this for the end but i can share my thoughts if, oh absolutely if, what i'm trying to do is we're I getting think, it out I there think we're addressing some of the concerns <clears throat> the public has and if we can yeah. show that we're getting to some sort of area here we might save two hours worth of public comment is and we have students in the audience that we would of course let you speak first but um go ahead. um so um yeah, I would have concerns with that, um, and I think I've given this a lot of thought, and uh, so please bear with me. It's a mm -hmm. little bit lengthy. Um, first, I do want to acknowledge uh, the difficult position that the district and staff find themselves in. Um, I've heard from a number of people that the current problem is the result of poor planning on the part of the school district. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, it was the school district that was the one that highlighted the need for a second high school back when Folsom High um, moved to its current location in 1998. 
um, they were the ones that kind of rang the alarm on that. Um, and it took many years. So at the time, you know, when Folsom was a lot smaller than it is today, the city and many in our community wanted this to be a one high school town. And as someone who grew up in Folsom and actually remembers how small it once was, uh, I find that sentiment really understandable. But the district was ultimately correct that we needed a second high school, given the projected growth in the community. Um, and unfortunately for us, by the time everyone agreed on that fact, uh, there was little land left to build the new high school on. The district did the best they could with the options they had available at the time. Fast forward 12 years after Vista del Lago opened in 2007, and we find ourselves in a difficult predicament with no easy solutions. The question before us is not as straightforward as it appears, because whatever decision we make is going to have an impact on students, on families, and on teachers. Uh, on the one hand, if we vote on either of these proposals before us today, uh, we'll be disrupting potentially the lives of and plans of current middle school students, potentially, maybe not if we are able to agree on, on, on a compromise. Um, but on the, and on the other hand, we do have a, an overcrowding issue at Vista. So uh, in my mind, um, I think that uh, based on the questions that I asked earlier, um, if my math is correct, uh, at the peak of resident projections, resident student projections, we're going to have in 2021, we're going to have, um, what is it in the chart here, 2,251 students. Um, if we assume, and I know that's not a safe thing to do, but if we assume a continued 20%, 20% uh, uh, of those kids are going to go elsewhere, whether it be Folsom High School, whether it be St. Francis or Jesuit or uh, John Adams, uh, we can, if, we, if we project that 20% into that, that puts our peak at 1,800 kids, which is less than we have today. Right. Um, I, I, I don't feel comfortable voting on a disruptive change to boundaries when at our peak we're going to be really less than we are today. I mean, today we're at 1896, but we have a lot of choice students still at Vista. Now, obviously, for the next 10 years, this means we're going to have to keep probably a cap at Vista. So that's not ideal, but we'd have to keep some sort of cap. Um, and number two, uh, we would probably potentially, if we hit that cap, have to not allow in some families that maybe move into the district after that, uh, after everyone else is already in. But I still think that we're trying to solve a problem here in a very disruptive way when this problem may self solve itself organically. We may need to weather the storm for a little bit, but I'm not, I guess a change this big, even if we do, a lot, even if we do apply it to fifth graders, current fifth graders, a change this big is, is going to be extremely disruptive. And I'm totally fine voting on that change if I think that it is absolutely necessary. I just don't see from the math based on our peak and based on you know, all these other factors what, uh, that it is absolutely necessary. So what I, I would ask my colleagues to reject these proposals, to not negotiate a different proposal. As an alternative, I think that we should, you mentioned in 2010 we did a big campaign. Let, let's figure out a big campaign to get more people to Folsom High School. I think that's absolutely something that could help uh, reduce these numbers even more. Uh, and and uh, pour our efforts into that as opposed to making a disruptive boundary change that's going to impact uh, a number of families in our community. So that's what I would say. I have a... I have a question for the superintendent. Um, is there a window that we're looking at that we have to approve either, either of these or, or come up with another option? If we're making any changes and we have to, we'll, we'll have to bring back the registration priorities into VISTA as we've done the last two years, no, no later, later than, than December. So a final vote would have to be December 19th because we do the pre-registration and the master schedule build come right. January. Okay. Well, well I'll, I'll just, just make, make a, a, a quick comment. I'm actually on board with Ms. Ranking. Uh, I kind of like what Mr. Hoover was saying, but I'm also 
thinking about the broken feeder system that we have or that will happen. And I'm just really concerned about that because I, I, you know, reading through notes, reading and looking at these numbers, I just don't think it's going to work. Uh, not for two A or three. I'm good with the six, seven, and eight. Um, you know, grades moving to Folsom Middle and then on to Vis- Vista. I'm good with the grandfathering. I'm good with uh, the choice. I'm good, especially with the siblings. That was one of my concerns of attending the same high school. What I'm not good with are the words of based on space availability. Because to me, that's kind of giving them some kind of hope, but it may not mature and may not happen. So I'm kind of concerned about that wording. I don't know if we can change that or if there's anything that we can kind of slide in place. But I'm really concerned about that based on space availability. But we'll make every attempt possible. <laughs> I, I think we, I mean, can, we can create some priorities that would mitigate the need for putting that in, but it would right. probably be stricter on some others. So knowing that. Okay. And one of the, um, to go to that, one, one of the unknown that. factors that we'll have to clarify too is uh, returning students from um, True. in that area. Make sure, uh, in the Vista area, currently living who are returning from non-public schools or not one of our schools, we'd have to figure out where to put them on that priority uh, list, which, tend, which popped up last year and created a challenge. We have to have a plan to work with that. Thank you. Mr. Short? Uh, just like I was saying earlier, um, that we're dealing with a, we can do a lot of wide ups here, and I know it's really difficult as a board to sit here and try and come up with a probabilis- probabilistic determination and analysis of all these what ifs. From my experience, a lot, it well, it's math, it's statistics. And basically, I can't predict. I, I just really can't. I've seen boundary changes here, closures of schools. And as Matt says, we do the best we can. That word is because we can't guarantee anything. We can't predict the the growth of a community, the economy, the demographics, the birth rate, all those things. We, we know we have a problem in front of us. I like what I hear about maybe doing the soft landing. Those are the kind of things, again, but those my, the only concerns I have is we keep prolonging solving the problem. We do have a, a feeder problem, and mm-hmm. we need to do something soon. I, I, if, it's, if we're talking about the soft landing, that's going to push it out further. And then it creates more unpredictable situations. But again, uh, whatever we can do to create that soft landing, I am for. However, I just want to caution that we're prolonging and we're right in the middle of a um, $18 million budget fall. And it, I don't know how this will impact how we do school sites, how we do, uh, we have a, a school site at Folsom below its capacity. Those are not optimiz- optimizing way we should be. Again, it's not an easy equation to do this, and uh, I, I am I am open to that soft landing, but again, I haven't seen how that would work and how long it pushes it out, and then we have to be cognizant of what that really means, Matt. I mean, like 3A, uh, 3 does have a faster balance to the feeders, which looks like the most optimal, right? 3A does have that in there. Is, is that more optimal for the elementary schools and they're on the three then versus the 2a because i know it's the 2a is it's kind of out of whack there mm-hmm. 2a because it's a continuum it was put as a as a possible solution it just doesn't get there as fast as right. three um, obviously three because you have Blanche Prince and Folsom Hills so it does provide the relief uh, almost immediately then it would allow some choice back into that Mm-hmm. 2A would obviously be a longer period of time before choice would be allowed back in, but you do have that continuum. Okay. Mr. Short uh, referenced that it might extend it or prolong it. I mean, how long would it take, or do you think you can have something back to us in two weeks, or do you think that it would probably take us into December? Now, um, I'm, I'm just curious. Are you talking about the registration policies? Yeah, and everything in place. I mean, if well, we were to policies have to be done yeah. because we have deadlines that they have to get information out. They they they, they would, would like, like to start notifying people on timelines and deadlines. So December would be the absolute for yeah. that, and that's why that portion was dictated out. Depending on the the board motion on this, 
who dictates how that policy is written. That's why that specific part could not be done until this was decided. Is it possible? Is what possible? To have everything in place by December to vote on. The registration policy? Yeah. I, I think it would have to be. Yeah. I, and it's going to take some collaboration That's between the all the instructional staff and everybody to come up with what those policies in place would need to be. I see that we have to, I think we have to vote on this next meeting. We have to have something that is either agreed upon tonight or brought back for next meeting with clar clarifiers. Um, correct? Yeah. As far as a motion on what you want to do to whatever on Both, the attendance yeah. boundaries, that needs to be, I think, my mm -hmm. recommendation needs to be decided on immediately so then whatever registration policies can be worked on. Because that can't start until we can know the path of what the policy is going to be for the boundary adjustment. Can I have a question? Can we could we decide on one of these with the amendment that we explore the uh, uh, you know add the soft landing concept to one of these two here? The 1900 capacity yeah, for the three yeah. years. Well, I think what you're saying is, is like a three. grandfathering of everybody. It's not really right. a soft landing. It's a grandfathering. Right. Grandfathering of, right. of those so, students in. Yeah. Yeah, that's not really a. That's that's just a. It's going to change the numbers. Change. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just moving it out further. Yeah, it's still yeah, it's moving it out. And and respectfully, Mr. Hoover, um, I wish I wish we could do that. Not do and I take it as kind of like not doing anything and continuing where the way we are, not make any changes. And at some point, I I I feel we have to trust that staff isn't has done their best to project. And their recommendation is that we do need to make some adjustments, so we're never going to full. We're going to have this problem. So that's how well, I. I mean, I hear you. I respectfully, though, I uh, I'm reading the staff's projections. Uh, that's where my numbers are coming from. And uh, the way my math works, if you had our peak today, we would have fewer students than we have today. And you yourself said at the beginning of the meeting that Vista is it's maintaining. So. I, um, I, I'm not suggesting that we do nothing. I think uh, we need to do a campaign again, like we did in 2010, to get as many people excited about Folsom High School as we can. And we honestly have the easiest pathway to do that ever because we have a brand new CTE building that we're, is opening bef for the next school year. And uh, I don't think that's doing nothing at all. So I'd like to hear from the public, though, if uh, you know, uh, before we make any vote. Absolutely. So um, I have a number of speakers here, but what I'm going to ask first is if there's any students whose names are on these cards to speak. Is there any students have, who have asked to speak? Okay. Would you mind coming up first and lining up? Because we want to hear from you and possibly allow you to go home and do your homework. <laughs> and make sure you say your name so if I have your card in here. Okay. Um, my name is Aiden Larkin. Okay. Oh, and um, one more thing. We're going to try to, Kelly, we haven't been able to make this work, and we're definitely going to need the two minutes, or we're going to. Uh... <clears throat> Sorry. Modern technology. Okay, you ready? Okay, begin, sir. My name is Aiden, and I'm a junior at Vista del Lago, and I have a sister at Folsom Middle. My family has lived in Folsom for 16 years in the Folsom Hills area, and we've always considered Vista to be, to be our neighborhood school. The district has been saying that there's a capacity problem at Vista, but I wanted to see how students felt about this issue. I sent a survey to my classmates and received 128 responses. 47% were juniors. 33% sophomores, 11% seniors, and 9% freshmen. Here are some of the results. 95% said that it was either important or very important to them to be able to attend the same school as their sibling. 90% of students said they have less than 36 kids in their core classes. 65% 65, 65 of uh, respondents said that they do not find it difficult to find space on campus to eat or, eat or study. When asked an open-ended question about what they would change or add to Vista, an overwhelming majority said more parking. <laughs> the district has stated that the cafeteria at Vista is overcrowded during lunch and there is nowhere to eat. 
This simply isn't true as, there, um, as the majority of kids sit outside or go to the library. If you walk inside the cafeteria during lunch, you will see an entire row of empty seats that only ever fill up during rainy days. The district is trying to rezone families who have lived here for over a decade to make room for new families moving into the community and the new developments with no existing ties to our community. The kids that I went to middle school with have developed into my best friends throughout high school, and I cannot imagine having the, not having these friendships. When I ask my friends when they became close with their older sibling, they always tell me it's when, the, when they started high school. I've been looking forward to getting this same experience with my sister. It bothers me knowing that this opportunity for a strong relationship with my sister may be stripped away due to poor planning and last second changes. The very least you can do is guarantee a sibling. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Um, good evening. My name is Audrey Lee. I am a seventh grader at Folsom Middle School in the boundaries of Folsom Hills. I am speaking for many students today. I don't, I don't think you understand what you would truly be doing by accepting one of these two proposals. You would be splitting up so many friendships. A lot of these friendships could last, for a, could last for a very long time, but you would be breaking these friendships apart. High school is a time when you need and depend on friends, and you would leave so many people without friends in high school. Also, if you have no or only a few friends, you are a target for bullying. The district is putting so much emphasis on stopping bullying, but by choosing one of these two proposals, you are giving more people more opportunities to bully or get bullied. Finally, I have thought of Vista DeLago as my high school for a while and will always think of it as my high school. I cheered for the Vista Junior Eagles for two years, so if you made me to go to Folsom High School, I would never truly think of it as my high school. Vista de Lago would still be what I thought of my high school as. I'm sure that you have heard a lot of people say similar things, but have you stopped and actually considered it? Have you thought about relationships and feelings or just numbers? I am not just a number. What I ask of you today is that you think of students as human beings with relationships and friendships, not just numbers on a spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Rademacher. I'm currently an eighth grader in Folsom Middle School and planning on going to Vista Del Lago. Uh, tonight, I'd like to address the boundary changes that will be considered by the uh, Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board. So as you probably know, many kids were planning on going to Vista Del Lago uh, next year with their friends based on land established attendance boundaries and were surprised to hear that the district might try to change these attendance boundaries. Um, there are like, I, I see a few issues with these boundaries and I'd like to discuss them tonight. Uh, my first issue with the proposed boundary change, changes is that there's a lot of kids that will be separated from their older siblings and friends. This will make a lot of kids sad, angry, and maybe not even want to go to school anymore. This, is this the outcome that the board wants to be left with? Because it's what's going to happen if you do that. So. My second issue with the school is the, the school survey that we took. Um, the options on the survey I felt like might have been a little tilted toward to try to make the kids want to go to Folsom High instead of Vista Del Lago High School. Like the children, they had to write their own, they had to write Vista Del Lago in, in the other response instead of having the school survey just have two answers, uh, Vista Del Lago or Folsom, Middle school, or Folsom High School. Um, my third issue relates to the previous school meetings with the school district where representatives indicated that there would only be grandfathering program for eighth graders the next year on a space available basis. Uh, the only problem is, is this depictive because there are apparently no such space available if only a boundary change is going to be considered. If you're going to have a grandfathering language, at least make a guarantee for eighth graders, otherwise it's just an empty promise. Finally, why aren't you taking kids from areas closer to Folsom High School in a boundary line instead of pulling kids all the way from Briggs Ranch? If you have to go to Folsom High every day, from if I, I have to go about 20 minutes in order to get to Folsom High School, and it will take me about 10 to get to Vista Del Lago every day. Thank you for allowing me to say my thoughts on this important matter. Thank you. 
uh, so maybe before our next speaker, we could maybe address a couple of your concerns, because I think there's language in here about giving siblings priority, and I think we can discuss with the superintendent how that needs to be strong language. And also, um, I believe the superintendent has addressed how we can redefine space availability. So you had you got that solved right away. <laughs> so thank you for speaking up. Angela. Thank you. I would just like to mention the fact how at a lot of these students' histories, um, ever since elementary school, it's been drilled into them that they would be going to a certain high school, and they haven't really imagined any other way for that to be. And I would like for you to consider that these students will be hesitant to other options but if you change the elementary school of like you're going to this high school then they'll be more open to considering the changing so thank you thank you okay i guess i could go through the big packet i believe um we have a number of speakers with Melanie Myers leading. Um, I, how did you plan on doing this? Were you all speaking or were you speaking for the whole group? I was just told to put you all together. <laughs> so, No, I, I do not plan to speak for the whole group. I think they've all submitted comment cards and they have their own things to say. Okay, did um, you want to speak? I. Okay. Yeah, did, all right, okay. You're on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to express gratitude to the board. We've reached out to many of you, and you've, you know, opened your schedules and and had time to meet with us and and really shared kind of where you're coming from, um, and we appreciate that. I also want to express gratitude for all the families who are here, who have taken so much time out of their lives to dig in, really understand the issues, and try to help you come up with solutions as well as you think through that, giving you perspectives that you may not get otherwise. Um, unfortunately, I think the choices that you've been presented with here tonight are, are not necessarily good ones. Um, and I think we really appreciate what um, Trustee Hoover has said here uh, in terms of the, 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 the issues resolve themselves largely over time, that we've done our own uh, analysis and we have um, someone else who will speak to those numbers. But um, I think that's what we found as well. This is a problem that solves itself. I do appreciate um, that Superintendent um, Kuligian, in your initial remarks, indicated that it really is the, uh, the, the infill, infill development, development and the new development that's coming in that's creating the crowding um, at VISTA, not our community. Um, and so I think there's a lot of concern among our families that we're just being asked to move um, in order to make room for other people who are new to the community. And that doesn't feel right to most of us. Um, you know, we hope that before making a decision of this kind of magnitude, you consider that there are less disruptive op options out there. And I think there's some great conversation. Um, Trustee Clark uh, asked some great questions, and Trustee Hoover as well. Consider those options first before disrupting our families. Um, so, you know, we, we urge you to, to, to vote no on these. And I think um, in the spirit of collaboration, a lot of us are passionate about this and have poured a ton of energy into this process. We want to help you come up with solutions, and we want to work with you on those longer-term solutions. And if we need to expand VISTA, you know, we'll help do that, too. So that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Cole. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cole. I have three Vista Del Lago students, a junior, two freshmen, and I have a fourth grader at Folsom Hills. I stood before you in October of 2018 as a parent who was frustrated with a lack of communication. And I wanna say thank you, because I'm coming now today with a heart of appreciation, and that's what I'd like to extend on behalf of all of us parents. So first, Dr. Kaligian, you looked at me that night and said, we will fix this problem with communication, you looked me in the eye and said that, and you followed through. And Daniel Thigpen, thank you for your communication. And um, I really appreciate the thought surveys, the emails, the newsletters. I was told by a board, the, the board uh, meeting last year through an email of a past Folsom Hills parent. That's the only way I knew to come. This year we knew, so thank you for that communication. I also wanna thank 
Mr. Thigben and Mr. Washburn and all of the staff. It is obvious there's been hundreds of hours poured into this and we do not take that lightly as parents. So thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunities of the open forums and thank you for the thought exchanges and thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. We didn't feel like we were a part of the solution last year. We feel more of that this year. So, so we, we come, come with a heart, heart of gratitude for that. I also want to thank personally, um, I'd like to thank our mayor, Carrie Howe, and I'd like um, to also thank Ernie Sheldon, who also met with us in just hopes of looking at some of that shared space as well. So they're open to the conversation too. I also just want to take a moment to thank each of our board members. David Reed, thank you for your openness. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us. Thank you for your way of just listening our hearts and our minds and collaborating with us. Josh Hoover, thank you for your out of the box thinking. That was our takeaway from our time with you. We appreciate that. Joanne, thanks for your mom's heart. That was evident to us. So we appreciate that and what you did for us there and listening to us and also letting us go to some of those difficult conversations too. Chris Clark, thanks for being a friend and a dad to our thousands of kids. That shined through and we appreciate it. Ed Short, thank you for your years of service on the school board and we appreciate you just allowing us to share our hearts and our minds with you tonight. Thank you. I'm superintendent, I'm wondering if maybe we could take a minute to address, and I'm afraid it might come up again throughout this discussion about the park next to Vista Del Lago and working with the city, um, what the logistics of that um, involve and the practical nature of it perhaps, if, because a lot of, uh, there is a lot of chatter about why can't we just put some portables on that park? So I think we might want to address that if we have a couple of minutes to do that. Is that possible? <laughs> well, I don't want to speak on behalf of the city, but we do work closely with the city. We had a two by two meeting. We have them regularly with the city. And I do want to reiterate, um, we've worked in partnership with them for many years. Um, Benevento Park is one where they're looking at building out, but they're looking at designing first and um, the design process uh, has, they're at the beginning stages of the design process of the park. Uh, and that is their first, their next priority on their list for developing parks. Um, they said that process would probably take about a year. And then after that, it's whatever the build out is after that. So that's about as much information as we have right now. Um, it, it is park land and the school district doesn't have the capability of a building on that. And sometimes um, it, the cost of building is underestimated as well. Um, and one other point, because we don't own the, the land of Benevento Park, the city owns it, we cannot use bond funds to build on land that we don't own. Nor was it described in Measure G when the voters passed that ballot measure. Just, I just want to try to get some clarification because that keeps coming up. Um, Daniel, um, I might mispronounce your last name. <laughs> now, if you've heard me pronounce some names, I'm not going to try this one. <laughs> it's uh, Daniel Schiavacase. So. That was on the tip of my tongue. I was going <laughs> to. All right. So uh, thank you uh, again for having me here. Um, I'm actually a dad. I have two kids that are attending Folsom uh, Middle School right now from the Folsom uh, Hills Boundary area. Um, I actually haven't been very involved uh, from the beginning, um, but uh, a lot of my friends have. I'm a CPA and they kept on asking me all these questions about the data and, and numbers, numbers and so, so on. on. And so finally this past week and I said, okay, let me take a look. Let me see if I can figure it out. Uh, I read the documentation, both the boundary report as well as uh, this uh, latest board agenda. And to be honest, I, I struggled uh, understanding it. Part of it is new terms. I've worked in the public sector, uh, actually United Nations, and I know it can be quite complex. It's new terms. Um, I think in some cases, I, there wasn't uh, enough uh, information in terms of the assumptions and what went into the estimates and projections and so on. So I also really struggled with uh, what, what's the difference between a projected resident, actual enrollments, and things like that, and you know why it's going up for uh, Vista and why it's going down uh, for Folsom at the same time when um, 
I, I just didn't have enough information to uh, kind of understand the factors. And second of all, I mean, I looked at the numbers that were presented in the board agenda. I tried to compare them here. I, I couldn't make sense of how they tie. Uh, clearly not enough information. So anyway, I do this for a living. I'm a kind of finance guy. So I actually uh, decided to take the data and try and create my own report. Uh, the results are, I, I still have some questions. I really tried my best, so I really appreciate a lot of the work that's been done. I, I also, I think as some of the comments have been made, I'm not really seeing a, a case here. I do see that there is some uh, overcrowding, but it does resolve itself. And in fact, uh, back to your question about 1,900 students, uh, certainly it can be done, uh, especially uh, without the, even uh, with new developments within a couple years. Uh, my main concern uh, really is the high growth, the impact of moving so many students over there, plus south of 50 at Folsom High School. Uh, I'm not really hearing anything about that. I didn't read it in the report. And these numbers don't include anything about the impact. And uh, Trustee Ed Short, uh, you're absolutely right. There are some issues with overcapacity. We really should start talking about the capacity issues that we're about to have at Folsom High rather than Vista. That's a much, much bigger problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Lee. Welcome. Hi there. Thank you, members of the board. My name, my name is Karen Lee, and I have two students at Folsom Middle School. Apparently, I'm over my two minutes already. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Um, my biggest concern I had with both of these proposals today is that I don't feel a true problem has been identified as Mr. Hoover presented himself. Based on the numbers, it resolves itself in three years, and the numbers start to declining. In addition to that, the data all over your website contradicts what has been presented today. If you look at the master, the facilities master plan of the district, um, it shows that Folsom High's optimal capacity is 2390. The number 3000 has been thrown around all over that we can get up to 3000. I don't know how quickly we're adding 610 students to Folsom High's optimal capacity and still keeping a excellent education for everybody. Nowhere have I been told what is being done to support the 610 additional students that Folsom High could potentially have. But again, it's just the optimal number on the master facilities plan on the website. So with just a minimal amount of searching on, your, on the district website, I was able to quickly find multiple documents that discount a lot of the data that has been presented here tonight. I'm asking you to not only vote no on both these proposals, but to also ask the district administration to be held a little higher accountability to make sure the data is in line with what else is on your own website. Thank you. Audrey Lee? Oh, okay, great. And did I get Aiden Larkin already? Okay. And you're still here. You could be watching in the comfort of your own home. <laughs> on YouTube. Okay, Amy Flynn. Put my glasses on. Hi, Hi. thank you for having us. Um, I have, I, my talk was going to be about broken feeder patterns. I feel like most of the board agrees that broken feeder patterns are horrendous. But before I step away from that, um, people who don't know, perhaps um, Mr. Short, the th scenario three that has the broken feeder pattern really does not serve our community in any capacity. Um, adding the ang high anxiety it would create, less connectedness to school, potentially affecting attendance with a decline in academic performance, feelings of social isolation. And I want to look, show um, quickly um, something that I pulled from the website, the district website, related to the new California dashboard. Um, this is part of the local control accountability plan, the required mandated reporting on the um, different um, priorities going on at the schools and, and how they're doing. One of them is uh, the culture of the school. Um, 80, 8% of fifth graders have high levels of belief in their self. Great, Folsom schools are doing fabulous in that level. All, the secondary level, we see a decline. How much of a decline? An area of concern that stood out was around secondary students' levels of social emotional distress, which encompasses anxiety, fear of embarrassment, tense feelings, and an inability to relax. 
a quarter of all seventh graders and over a third of our ninth and 11th graders report frequent bouts of social emotional distress. Add to that a broken feeder pattern, and that's just adding fuel to the fire. I think it's absolutely unacceptable that that was even brought forth. I, and furthermore, I feel like I need to convince Joanne that 2A is a bad decision, and making a bad decision uh, is worse than making no decision at all in this case. I, I really appreciated your perspective because you have a historical connection to this community as a mother, as well as um, you know ties to the community at large. I'm not sure you keep telling us to trust the, trust the process. We tried. The um, questions that were put forth to Mr. Washburn today, he didn't know the actual enrollment numbers on certain things. He doesn't, um, even Mr. Short was asking about things related to sewage and um, facilities numbers. Those were never presented. We asked for them at one of the exchange, um, thought exchange forums. We were not given data that showed there were structural problems that needed to be solved at VISTA. We are happy to partner to solve those problems. I don't think either of these scenarios do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Harry Shaw. Harry. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you for and thank you to the board members that met with us. That was. Wonderful, because it made us feel like you were listening, and us as parents and part of the community, um, that's very important. I am a mother of three boys. I have a ninth grader at Vista, I have a sixth grader at Folsom Middle, and I have a third grader at Folsom Hills, and I've lived here for over 16 years. As, as people have stated thus far with the issues in um, what's been presented, a few that pop up for me personally, in addition to everything else, because I agree with everyone here, the community, and how they're feeling, is the wording in there for siblings going on to the high school if they already have siblings there i would like to see that be remedied by saying instead of space available like this is happening and so something like that would be ideal um i i also have a huge issue with the broken feeder patterns again reiterating what other parents have said that terrifies me thinking that you're going to send my, my third grader to a middle school that's not gonna naturally feed into the high school. Um, as Amy mentioned, socially, academically, I think that could be detrimental to our children. And um, third, I know they were talking, um, Mr. Washburn was talking about walking distances. Is that walking distances to high school? Because what you're presenting to us now is walking to Folsom High. And so that just seems like quite a distance when you're looking at it for us Briggs Ranch, you know, Willow Creek residents. Um, that just doesn't really make sense. So I didn't know where that was coming from when I saw that on the presentation. And I also agree with the issue into Folsom High. If you're going up to 3,000 people, that not only academically, socially could be a lot, it could be a safety issue too when there's that many on a campus. And I think that's a huge concern. Um, even just meeting with a few of the members, I think as a community, we came up with some pretty cool ideas and maybe solutions to the issues at Vista. And I'll use that term loosely because I don't really see issues at Vista. I have a son there and never has he complained about a lunch issue, a bathroom issue. I mean, it's, and parking, honestly, I don't really think that's an issue regardless. I know it is for teenagers, but they can get there and we can help them. So I just would urge you guys to really look at the two scenarios that are presented to you and maybe not do anything because I feel like this will remedy itself. I really do. And seeing the data that this amazing community has, has researched over the last few weeks and months has been incredible. So I hope you take that to heart and rethink those decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Cassandra? And then after Cassandra, Casey Lee. So maybe if Casey could be ready, we can move a little faster. Because we do have um, not we do have a big budget discussion tonight too. So Casey. Hello, I'm Cassandra Niklevsky. I'm a 15 year resident of Folsom. I have two boys, one in sixth grade at Folsom Middle and one at Folsom Hills in fourth. Um, I'm a real estate agent in the area. I've been selling houses here for 10 years, so I want to touch on two things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the first is the boundary drawn by both scenarios feeding into Vista, which would be Empire Oaks, Russell Ranch, and Oak Chan. These residents are in Hillcrest, Empire Oaks, Lexington Hills, and Parkway. 
These neighborhoods have the highest median priced homes and the highest median incomes in the city of Folsom. So we're starting to draw a line from a financial standpoint in our community. The demographics of VISTA's enrolled population will change if the scenario is proposed to go through. It will negatively impact student socioeconomic diversity at VISTA. And there's a concern of creating an obvious segregation of the students by their socioeconomic status if the high schools are divided by this manner. We've already heard chatter from the students about what neighborhood you live in and um, the boundaries. And then also, I don't know if you're aware, but all of the Section 8 housing in Folsom, um, which those students are also entitled to choice at this time, will all be directed to Sutter and Folsom High. So we're creating a clear line there that no Section 8 students have a place in Folsom Middle or Vista High School, which I think is un unfair. Um, from the other standpoint, I'm married to a firefighter. He's a first responder. And when I think about a high school having upwards of 3,000 students, it scares me to death. Um, with what's happening in our communities and at schools, we're at risk for many catastrophic events. And the fact that a 14 to 18 year old student would be there with thousands of people is just too many in my opinion. Thank so, you. Thank you. So um, after Casey, Ruth um, Farfan, if you could be. Thank right. you. Good evening, my name is Casey Lee. Uh, I've been a part of this process for the past year. I read through the attendance boundary report and uh, I, unfortunately I find the whole process and the report a failure. Uh, I think it fails our students first of all. Uh, you look at the guiding principles and of those principles the one that's blatantly missing is any form of attention on con continuity of education for students which happens to be a discrepancy with what I found inside of the FCUSD master facilities plan which states as I quote these specifications seek to maximize the benefits to our students by providing seamless transitions through middle and high school, a critical, a critical issue for student success, end quote. What's more, in the 11,000 plus words, beautiful charts and fantastic uh, graphs, I, I don't see the following words show up at all. Oh. Seamless, social, emotional, relationships or continuity. It wasn't given any attention. This was over-focus on numbers and lack of focus on any of the people behind those numbers. Secondly, this failed parents. I stood here a year ago and presented at this lectern uh, 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 pleading for two things. One, uh, adequate time for transition, and two, uh, no broken feeder patterns. Uh, since then, I participated in all the, the events. I completed all the surveys. Overwhelming response has been exactly the same. Adequate time for transition and no broken feeder patterns. Uh, all of that feels like a waste of time. Our questions were not answered. We wrote them down. We didn't get responses. Uh, proposals were quickly dismissed at these open forums uh, and, and here we are again a year later with the same proposal for the same schools with the same broken feeder patterns how is that a success how is that community engagement to me that feels like we spent the last year just to check the box and say yep we engage the community lastly I think it fails the board 12 months ago you tasked the staff with coming up with this report after spending an entire year they came back with pretty much the same proposal if I did that if I was given 12 months and came back with the same answer, I'd be fired. You, presented, you were presented with a false dilemma today. You were given two choices and told that these were your two options. That, that's not the only two options. Nowhere in the report does it discuss what happens if you do nothing. What is the problem and what is the outcome if no option? So as a result, you're forced to make two choices and, and there's more options than that. After reviewing the report, I'm in a position where I, I don't have any confidence in the future presentations that are gonna come from this staff. And I, I think that if you vote on these, you're voting on a mediocre proposal. My, my request to this board, my um, ask of this board, is that you would demand more from this work, that you would ask for real problems being defined. You would ask for uh, more creative solutions that address all the concerns that you heard from the community and, and lastly, that we'd put the perspective on the whole child, not just the numbers in a spreadsheet. That's it, thank you. Um, Sherry Hughes or Hugh? Hugh and uh, then Min Yang after um, Sherry, if you could be ready, Ming. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Ruth, right? <laughs> okay, sorry. 
Hi. Um, as some of you know, I have a lot to say, so I'll do my best to do this in two minutes. Mr. Lemberg's familiar with all my words. <laughs> um, I, I just, I am here to say that I, I, I don't want you to do nothing, but I don't want you to adopt or work with the choices you've been given. And I'm going to give you a little context. Seven months ago, my husband and I evaluated very seriously moving out of Folsom. We went, met, we, moved, we went to Idaho several times. We met with realtors, and we kept coming back to, we've lived here for 20 years. We have three kids, fifth grader, seventh grader, ninth grader, and this is our community. And we were torn because there were a lot of reasons that said we need to go. And my mom died unexpectedly in my arms, and we said to ourselves, this is our home, this is our community, and it, it gave us that perspective. And the past few weeks with these families and the amount of dedication, this isn't just about don't move our children. This is about expecting more for our community. We are lucky. We live in an amazing community with amazing schools. And I will spearhead any parent committee you want to say, what are the interim solutions we can do? I don't want to see any child, whether it be mine or someone else's, go to a high school that is 3,000 students. I don't know how we can really say that that's academic excellence. I don't know how we can achieve this. We had amazing conversations. I saw those schools in Idaho. I will work with you to see these smaller defined high schools. I am committed. I made a commitment to not go to Idaho, and I made a commitment to stay here and be part of this community, not just for my children, because I want my children to have a community they want to move back to when they're done exploring their lives. I want them to come back to mommy, but <laughs> but I, 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 it's not just me that has this commitment. So I am begging you not to vote today, not to select. And, and again, I know how much work went into this and I don't want to discount that. I am not saying that people's hearts weren't in the right places, but we didn't, we didn't hit it. We didn't, this is not the best we can do. And I could sit here and ramble off a million interim solutions. I have a daughter at Vista. How are we utilizing the space? Some of you have been lucky enough to hear about my, my wonderful home analogies about that. But I'll meet with you, Mr. Short. You didn't have an opportunity to meet with us. I would love to go over it with you. I will meet with you. I will do whatever you need to have us as a community be part of the solution, but I don't think they've brought it to you yet. So I respectfully ask that you do not adopt any of this. Thank you. Thank you. Terry <laughs> and then Ming. Uh, Chair Hewitt, I've lived in Empire Ranch since 99. Uh, bought the houses and the coyotes. So we had always had the family plan to go to Vista. Sounds like, I'm just gonna put it out there, it doesn't sound like anything will probably get decided tonight. That's my take, and I think that's great. Um, the only thing I would like to uh, ask is that you guys, when you do make your language about how you actually accept students into the school, that you're very clear-lined on how those decisions are made, especially if you're talking about uh, the new developments and those new neighborhoods, if those folks are not grandfathered in, or people who are buying uh, right next to Empire Oaks, right? I mean, I can think of people who are bouncing from one neighborhood to the next, and depending on the timing of that, there's a chance that those folks not, might, might not be able to go to Vista, from what you had said. So if you're deciding to make some of those decisions as solutions, that just very, very clear cut, or very clear definitions of how that's being done, instead of soft language, because the soft language is partially why we're here. So just have really good, firm language we all know what we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ming, and then, um, Farron, if you could be ready after Ming. Hi, um, I'm a mom from the Blanche Sprints Elementary School area. I have two kids currently at Blanche Sprints Elementary. And um, I was at the last two uh, public forum and I was here before the public forum started and talked to you guys about this. Um, I don't, and I, I'm glad that you guys don't like the two choices that's been presented to you today. Um, it actually makes me feel better because I don't like them either. Um, our school is a small school. Our kids know each other since kindergarten, and they have they form a really tight bond because it is a small school. And f in the future, as you're considering other options that's going to be placed before you, um, I would hope that you consider that because and I can only speak for our school, that these kids form this really tight bond and they have this small group of kids that they grew up with, that they go to the middle school with these kids and as they form additional friendship to help them go into high school in a much bigger education surrounding with a lot more thousands of kids that they get to maintain those little few friendship that they have made 
from kindergarten on because like everybody has said bullying is a huge issue in middle school and high schools and I would like my children to maintain and to keep those friendships that they have built to help them navigate through these it's I mean school is not how I grew up. I mean, we had bullying, but it just seems like they're much more severe these days, just from the news and things like that. And for me, as a parent of two small kids, I'm here to advocate for them that they have this support system with them, that they have spent so much time to build that they can keep that with them as they're going. I mean, whatever you guys decide, I want them to be together from middle school, elementary to middle school to high school. Thank you. Thank you. Farron, and then Laura Peterson Schaefer, if you could be ready next. Hi. Hi, good evening. I first want to say thank you to the board members for letting the public speak, and then also to Mr. Washburn and Mr. Thigman. Thank you for um, spending all your time putting all the data together. Um, I went to all the forums. I did all the thought exchange. Um, the one thing that I never felt like we were um, being heard with was the broken feeder pattern. That was like huge on the list. That came with like four stars. It was like 4.5 or something, but that was never brought out in the presentation. It's really important to me for students not to be sent to one middle school and then be broken and go have to go to another high school. I know that's been reiterated um, here many times, so I hopefully you hear that loud and clear. It's really important to us. Um, and then safety. Folsom Hills is further from most schools to Folsom High. How is that safer? So that's my question. How is it safer? And then I also wanted you to think about Folsom High. If so many new students are going to be going there, that's going to be impacted. Counselors, there's going to need to be more counselors. You were talking, Mr. Short, you're talking about sewage and all that. Like that's going to be more as well. So we need to think of both schools in that sense, not just because Vista has impacted right now. So changes being made there are going to change Folsom High as well. So that needs to be thought of as well. So thank you for thank your time. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, and then um, Garciella. Hi there, I'm Laura Peterson Schaefer. Thanks for letting me talk tonight. Uh, my concern is just one step further. I have kids that have been in the Spanish magnet program at Folsom Hills. So that is not necessarily a home school, but that's what we consider our home. From kindergarten on, six years with these kids, going on to Folsom Middle. My, I have a daughter who's in eighth grade right now and another one who's in fifth. My eighth grader has been with her friends since kindergarten. This is her home. I went to Folsom Middle. I didn't do a choice farm because we had either middle, either high school was explained from the get-go, from the orientation, from the brochure that I have sent on um, to David Reed to bring up that issue. I know since they've changed the brochure, but that didn't solve the problem. When you put a child in a school, they stay with their friends. Middle school, we've been, like I said, eighth grade, we've been through two and a half years without one little bit of drama, no bullying, no nothing in my little daughter's friend group. And I don't want her to change high schools and go with all new friends and try to start over again. This is, this is emotional thing is such a huge, huge issue at this age. 13 is a very vulnerable age. So I really want you to consider not just the Folsom Hills and the Blanche Sprints, but also the Spanish Magnet Program, because that's a huge part. I consider Folsom Hills our home school and going all the way to Vista. So just keep that in mind as well. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, <laughs> before, um, Superintendent, I believe that has come up before. We need a, a, a number on those students that were in that flex program who and because of the brochure so I think we had to follow up with the number on those so if the board wanted to take those in consideration thank you well, well thank you for having us and um, I just want to add as all the parents pretty much speak out for me I want to have I want to see a grandfathering I want to make sure that before you break the schools you take in consideration the kids because having a kid who has emotional distress anxiety going to school and not having that circle of friends from starting in middle school it's going to be brutal for the kids so before you guys make a decision think about the kids because the kids should be the first thing before any numbers that's it thank you um, kathy gentry followed by peter weiss
Good evening. This is I'm Kathy Gentry, and this is my daughter Madeline. She is a seventh grader at Folsom Middle School, and she previously attended Folsom Hills Elementary School. So I think that based on the conversations that you've heard from everybody tonight, all of our emails, etc., I hope that the board is in agreement that the two options are no longer a viable solution at this point. I do appreciate the fact that you're considering approach a phased-in approach with six to eighth graders. However, I do not agree with the grandfathering language. I am in a unique situation. My son is actually, he was supposed to go to Vista Del Lago. He is currently at Folsom High. He choiced in because of the music program. And we did not know anything about this music program until eighth grade when his music teacher asked him to join the jazz program. So I do think you need to market that, so that's just a side note. Anyway, my concern is that my daughter, she wants to go to Vista Del Lago. As of tonight, we're still considered in the boundary. I hope that still stays the same. My concern that she's going to get lost in the shuffle of the uh, whole grandfathering language. I need it to be a little bit more concrete. I'd like a written guarantee that she's going to be accepted into Vista Del Lago. Now, I think as for the other families, I think we need to revisit drawing, redrawing the boundaries at the elementary school level and talking about the different feeder patterns again. And also, my other side note, please revisit the parkway. I'm in a weird section of the parkway. I'm not in the older one. I'm kind of in the middle. So basically, I'm in the wrong, I'm at the wrong roundabout. <laughs> okay, so the first and the second roundabout get to go to Oak Chan. I'm actually closer to Oak Chan. I'm right at the third roundabout. So we're actually going to be waving to our neighbors as we drive in opposite directions to go to different schools. So if you look at the boundaries, I'm actually closer to Vista Del Lago than the older parkway folks. So anyway, um, now on the flip side, my son is at Folsom High. Everybody wants to push everybody at Folsom High. Um, the classes are crowded. Kids are not getting their classes. Kids are taking, trying to take summer school, then summer school gets canceled. So we need to take that into consideration as well. And the student to counselor ratio is extremely high. It's like almost one to 600, one to 580. And I recently had an issue and it took three weeks for a counselor to get back to me. So anyway, please vote no on both options. Please consider the phased approach. Please consider being more concrete than having grandfathering language. We need to have a guarantee. Thank you. Peter and then um, Eric. Uh, random Eric <laughs> thank you actually I have nothing further to add other than to say that I stand in agreement with the uh, partic the public participants here and I appreciate the board's paced and thoughtful approach particularly not only not only to the um, to the plans but also to the the grandfather language and, and unfortunately how slippery it is right now so thank you very much oh thank you Eric and I believe we have Robert, too. Do we have Eric and Robert? Oh, okay. We had you earlier. Okay, let's see if your dad can do better. Okay, come on. <laughs> Try to top him. Oh, I don't think I can top that. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, my name is Robert Rademacher, and um, I um, came tonight because I wanted to speak as well on uh, these uh, proposed um, um, boundary adjustments. And um, I wanted to say uh, first that just to maybe go over a little history. It was my understanding that when Vista was originally being planned, that it was supposed to be for t about 2,000 students, and maybe Mr. Short could um, fill us in on what happened, why we're, why we're down to just around 1,700 uh, for, for Vista Del Lago. Um, secondly, um, I wanted to say that I consider these boundary adjustment um, proposals to be kind of the nuclear option, and I don't think that we need to go there. I agree with with the board that there are other um, softer options that should be considered first, and that data will have to be gathered so we can seriously um, consider those and decide which one would be um, which option would be the best for the community. Um, so the, the one option or proposal that I would suggest um, would be to alleviate the overcrowding at VISTA uh, would be to um, require all high school age students of families moving into Folsom after June 1st of uh, 2019 um, attend only Folsom High School regardless of their location within the city until the overcrowding problem at VISTA is alleviated. 
after that time, um, new high school age students would be admitted to VISTA on a space available basis in line with, um, with current district boundaries. Um, I think that uh, if, if if that is done, I think it could be a, it could be a solution. And then also, I think that um, uh, with that, uh, the the um, the the natural decline in um, attendance at Vista would would take over and possibly solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have Jared, and then Jessica. And I got a note that there is a second Andrew Larkin who wants to speak. I was a little confused on that. Okay, so there is no one else to speak? And you're, okay. Okay, so you'll get to end the, uh, you'll get to end the comments. Thank you, Jared. All right, thank you. Um, I was originally going to speak on the two um, proposals, but I guess uh, we're probably moving past that. So um, I just want to say that, um, well, first of all, Jared Quick, I have a fifth grader and uh, three kids uh, oldest is a fifth grader at Folsom Hills um, so I don't I can't talk to your grandfather anymore what happens at any of the middle or high schools um, but uh, you know I would just say whatever you guys come up with please you know consider um, the, the numbers and making sure that we um, you know, the kids still get a good education with the numbers that um, that we can come up with and that um, you know some hard decisions may have to be made. Um, I was originally for actually for scenario three because it, the numbers did make sense, and um, uh, I was okay with the feeder patterns because two elementary schools get to go through the same feeder pattern together. Um, I realize that's not the popular choice, but uh, um, you know I I think that um, minimal disruption is needed uh, with making the numbers make sense. And also, um, I wanted to specifically mention on 2A, um, the, where we had to send people to Sutter um, from Folsom Hills. Um, I, I live um, right by Folsom Middle within walking distance. I'd have to go by Folsom Middle to get to Sutter. So I would suggest if that was um, still in the, in the cards that uh, some sort of busing situation uh, could be implemented because it, we can walk to Folsom Middle from my house. So thank you. Thank you. Jessica and then Andrew. Good evening. My name is Jessica. I, um, I've lived in Folsom for 15 years. I am a teacher in the district um, and I've worked for Folsom Cordova for 15 years. I've actually taught some of the students in this room tonight as well as some of the um, children of these wonderful parents. Um, so I am here tonight because I live in Briggs Ranch. I have two little ones who attend Folsom Hills, and they um, they have choice in Folsom Hills. They're in the FLESS program. So our homeschool is Blanche, even though we live in Briggs Ranch, um, our street address has us at Blanche Sprint. So I'm here tonight for, um, for two reasons. My concern is we're not the only family in this boat. I know someone earlier mentioned they are um, Blanche homeschool and in the FLESS program. Those kids have been together since kindergarten, and my concern is that they would be split up um, hypothetically from their Folsom Hills peers. Um, so I urge the board to please consider allowing them to keep their Folsom Hills homeschool status in this, in this um, rezoning process. Um, another concern is the educator point of view here tonight every year the district sends us to this wonderful conference called PBIS and we get to learn these amazing strategies it stands for positive behavior intervention um, and support or strategies anyway the takeaway is what we all know students perform well when they are supported emotionally socially they feel comfortable they want to go to school and um, and we all know that and we're all here for that reason tonight. So I'm just here to emphasize that social emotional piece. Um, please keep the kids tracked together six through 12. Um, please don't split the Folsom Hills FLESS kids from their Blanche Sprints FLESS peers who have gone to school together since kinder. Um, I urge you guys to consider another scenario that keeps them tracked together and Thank you for your time. It's much easier talking to kindergartners than it is a board. So thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, my name is Andrew Larkin. I'm a parent in the Folsom Hills uh, zone. I've got a, a high schooler at um, Vista Del Lago and a middle schooler, eighth grader at Folsom, Hill, Folsom Middle. Um, <clears throat> so I'd actually like to go back to the topic that came up before about the actual physical space at Vista Del Lago and the ability to put either put portables on campus or expand the campus in some way, because it was mentioned that uh, Vista is landlocked. So um, at one of the community forums, the second one, uh, we were asking about you know the portables that are empty at Folsom Middle. Could those be relocated to, to Vista to help alleviate the capacity concerns? And uh, you know at the time we were told that no, there's no space, right? So we've done some of our own investigation um, thanks to the magic of Google Maps and uh, walking the campus. Um, we started to look for ways uh, that you could utilize the campus space to one, uh, accommodate portables, and two, uh, possibly expand. So uh, first of all, if you look at the campus, there's a there's two softball fields, one uh, that is adjacent to the main um, learning area on campus, and that softball field, one, the second softball field, has a, a very large expansive outfield that's not a regular sized outfield for a softball field. So um, we feel that there's actually, we're looking at it, there's space there where you could section off part of that outfield to put uh, portables there. So that's something that, that can be done within the existing footprint of Vista right now. Um, but then we started to think, is there ways that we could um, think outside the box to find other ways to expand on campus? And to that end, uh, a group of parents and I, um, we met with the mayor and we met with um, <clears throat> Councilman Ernie Sheldon uh, to discuss the land next to Vista that's been um, designated for the park, Benevento Park. And uh, we were talking to them about options for joint use. And uh, the city was very open to the ideas of joint use of that property. And joint use would come in two fashions. One, they are planning a softball field for that park. And the idea being that if Vista were to use that field jointly uh, with, the, um, with the city, then all the space that's currently taken up by that softball field on campus could be reallocated for portables, permanent structures, however you want to use it. And um, to the point of, uh, it was brought up earlier that you know, we, wouldn't, we couldn't put portables on the park space. So this would not be doing that. That would be opening up space on campus so we could raise a bond measure to raise funds to build in that space. And it's quite a large space. Actually, some of the existing large structures that are there now could fit in that space. Uh, the other thing that we talked about in joint use was a parking lot. So um, as we know, there's a lot of discussion about par parking issues at Vista. Um, <clears throat> so in discussing that with the city, they said the parking lot they build at this, the parking lot at this park could be joint use. And they're, they're more than willing to allow Vista students to park there if it will alleviate some of the parking issues on campus. And uh, <clears throat> Ernie Sheldon even suggested that they can make that parking lot bigger than they would normally make it for uh, a park. And he actually suggested up to 100 parking spaces. Um, he felt that if he could help the students and help the school um, by making uh, some concessions on his park uh, or the, the park, then he'd be willing to do that. So I um, just wanted to, that's food for thought. I'd like you to just keep that in mind when thinking about how we might utilize our space. Thank you. So, thank you. So I hope I didn't miss any speakers. So I'm just going to try to recap where. I think we are here, okay? Um, and maybe find a way. I, I don't think the board is in a position to make a decision tonight. I think there's a couple of things that might need to be vetted and brought back to our next meeting to make sure that we are looking at all possible things. I think um, it, it sounded like we did not accept the proposed solutions. It sounded like there was um, some support for capping Vista at 1900 for three years. and. Uh, uh, doing everything we can to assure that the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders would get in there and then route the f f current 5th graders to Folsom Middle, uh, I'm sorry, Blanche Sprints Elementary and Folsom Hills Elementary 5th graders would be assigned to Folsom High, Folsom Middle with an option to school choice to Sutter. I want to add to that, I would like to know what would happen if we put them for next meeting, the cliffhanger here, if we put them, if we assign them to Sutter with the school choice back to Vista, or back to Folsom Middle, which is addressing some of the concerns of the con continuity, or if we don't have space for all of them, if we assigned 
we know we, you the recommendation was to send Folsom Hills there, so we know we could send one there. So I want to explore if we could clean that up. Mr. Hoover recommended that we uh, just let it flow the current process and it should be fine. The numbers play out that it, we don't need to make a change. I think that that is something that we need to look at if we look at with the comment that any new residents into Folsom would go to Folsom High. We don't know how that is going to impact the numbers, how great that would be. So I think that's an unanswered question that supports the discussion about Mr. Hoover's suggestion. So in recapping that, did I miss, miss anything? anything? Okay, is there, then we'll go to board comments to see if we could either get direction to bring those back or if there's other things that the board wants to see come back to the next meeting. And I hope I'm making sense, okay? Any, Mr. Reed. Yeah, uh, a couple things. Um, first, I wanna speak to the, the broken feeder patterns. Um, and this is, this is personal to me. I, I, I do not want to see any broken feeder patterns. Um, I was in a, um, a feeder pattern when I was a child uh, from, from uh, up until eighth grade. And my parents thought it was a good idea for, to send me to another high school because they thought it was the better high school. Um, and I went with, I think, three other students from my middle school to that high school. So we were a cohort of three. And it was the most, it was the most miserable experience I've ever had. Um, at least two, the first two years there. Um, bullying would be an understatement. Um, so the, the parent that mentioned, you know, the issue about bullying, when you uh, attend a different high school with a broken feeder pad, and I can tell you it's true from personal experience. So I, I don't want to see any broken feeder patterns. Um, second, um, on the survey, um, I think it was slide seven. Um, I might have closed that slide. But anyway, um, I think it was slide seven that had uh, um, walking, uh, the principle of, of, of a close walking uh, distance. And, and because, and I agree 100% with that, and because of that, I personally want to have Folsom Hills taken off of any consideration that would take them anywhere other than Vista del Lago. And the reason why I say that is you look at the, 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 the distances between um, uh, Folsom Hills and Folsom High School versus Folsom Hills and, um, and Vista del Lago. Folsom Hills, and, and by the way, I'm measuring it from, from school to school. That It's actually further, uh, depending on where you are in the neighborhood. But for uh, Folsom Hills to, uh, f uh, to um, Vista del Lago, it's 3.6 miles. Folsom Hills to uh, F Folsom High School is 4.6 miles. So that's an extra mile. Blanche Sprints, right now, is um, 4.3 miles to Vista del Lago, but it's only 2.7 miles to, uh, to Folsom High School. And I, I always like to put myself in the perspective of, of a parent that lives in these two, two areas. And if I had a, uh, my son say to me, Dad, can I ride my bike to Folsom High School? And I lived in the Folsom Hills neighborhood, I'd be I mean, well, I'll change my language. Heck no. Um, uh, no way are you riding your bike to, to, to uh, Folsom High School. If I was a parent in the, in the Blanche Sprints neighborhood and I got the same question, I might not be thrilled with it, but 2.7 miles is something that I could probably live with if uh, I thought they were responsible and, 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 and able to do that. Um, there is no other school other than Carl Sundell that is a farther distance from a, a high school than Folsom Hills is to Folsom High School. So I think it's ridiculous that we're even having this conversation about Folsom Hills going to Folsom High School. Um, The other issue that you know, I want to, to raise is the issue of smaller high schools. And, and I raised this, I don't know, it was probably the first month, maybe the second month I was on the board. Um, 
I, I have a huge problem with these mega high schools that we have. And you know what? I'm going to call Vista del Lago a, a mega high school. It, it may be 1900, may not be Folsom High School that's, that could potentially get up to 3000. But I think, you know, these large comprehensive high schools are not for everybody. Some students thrive in them. Some students don't. I would like to see the district seriously consider, and I, this is probably, an, this is a longer term issue. I, I, I admit that. But explore the idea of opening one, two, maybe even three smaller high schools, 100 students per class, 400 max, that are, are basically academy style that's focused on a single subject matter, whether it's a trade school, uh, a sciences school, uh, performing arts school, whatever you know, come up with, as a way to um, reduce the, the, the population or um, uh, issues at uh, both Vista del Lago and Folsom High School, because I don't want to see Folsom High School at 3,000 either. That's where all my kids are going, and I certainly don't want to see them in a, in a high school of 3,000. And then as for uh, sending uh, multiple schools to, to Sutter Middle School, and I, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk as a parent here of, of two Sutter Middle School students. I don't want that school to become a, a, a become a population crisis in our attempt to solve the Vista del Lago. So, you know, again, I, I would like to explore um, Blanche Sprints with the with the the, uh, the grandfathering of the all current sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at um, that are from that that school uh, to Vista del Lago and start fresh with the current fifth year class. Um, those are my observations. So, so just to add to the list, then the board will expect to see a recommendation that assigns uh, Blanche Sprints to Folsom Hill, uh, to Folsom High and Sutter Middle. The impact of that option. Okay, so so far we got three. Say that's in the. Report. It is the packet. It's it's okay. one it's one a one a. Okay. It's one a it's yeah. One a. So we want to bring that one back to talk about that one too. Okay. All right. And just, I have a quick question for uh, Curtis. Oak Chan was in a conversation at one time. Uh, why was that taken off? I'm just curious. So, um, yeah, actually, I'm going to pass this over to Dan because he has the data uh, from Thought Exchange and the. Um, here, here you go. go. When we first proposed the scenarios, and uh, we showed you that snapshot earlier uh, in the evening. Um, that was one of the lower rated options uh, involving Oak Chan. Uh, when we engaged our community at September 19th and continued to look at the pros and cons, taking that into account and revising our scenarios that was taken off the table. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to know that. Um, and Mr. Reed, thank you for the, uh, the mileage that you talked about because I was actually looking at that as well. Um, I'm actually good with Mr. Reed's uh, suggestions as long as we spruce up the language on the, the grandfathering, grandfathering and the 6th, um, 7th, and 8th uh, that we talked about and also um, I think I mentioned the um, availability space. space so um, you know the two proposals that we have now I, I just don't support at all Okay, so we're still up to three <clears throat> options coming back next time I'm reading. Okay, Mr. Short. Yeah. Three. Three. The, oh. We'll recap them at the uh, end to make sure everybody's uh, following the I just want to appreciate the board's deliberation on this and also everybody, everybody here. This is what the process is all about. And I also do want to recognize staff recommendations. They, they did a wonderful job. I, I don't want to dem demonize anybody. It's just a process. And like I was saying earlier, we're dealing with uh, we're trying to draw a straight line, and I, I have to say that you know, taken by itself is needs a caveat because we're dealing with a nonlinear, very many variables. You got the emotional, you got all these things. There's no one person that can make that. We got to make a collective decision. What's best information in front of us? Some of it's not even quantitative. It's just it's nearly impossible to make it. Other boundaries uh, issues that I've done here and and school closures. We thought we were heading in a certain direction. We thought this school would have certain enrollment and things. Not all subject to change in two to three years. We just don't have a crystal ball. We do the best we can with a projection, but 
again, uh, we make assumptions today. I just never seen a linear analysis ever take care of itself. I'm sorry. I mean, that's like we have to make some sound decisions and we're going to have to be able to adjust ourselves as we go along. However, uh, I am in support of making and hearing everybody here and supporting staff's recommendations and maybe coming up with a more of a collaborative or maybe um, uh, more of a synergy going on on maybe taking what we learn from staff here because you guys uh, and everybody here did a lot. I mean, we spent hundreds and hundreds of hours and tens of thousands of dollars, folks, here to make this work. It, it has to have some of that process can't just be tossed out. Some of that has to be integrated somewhere. And I think some of that information, the feeders is a problem. I can see all the other districts don't have broken feeders. Is there a feeder actual data and impacts on that? Maybe we, we want to preserve that. But what happens if we get backed in a corner and, and as, as I've seen Matt before, when he does these optimization calculations and models, it's basic numbers per household. So sometimes you're constrained by cause and effect being reversed on the numbers. Uh, yeah, it's not just numbers, but we got to figure out different ways to do that. Matt, you're the magic guy that knows how all these numbers, you've been doing it for years. I've been seeing you doing it. it you're amazing. Uh, the staff is amazing when they do all this stuff, but it has to fit in with the community. It has to fit in with everybody's in the best optimized way. It has to be a balanced approach. Uh, but again, that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's so many variables. It's, it's almost chaotic theory in a sense. Um, I thought it was interesting. I was talking to you earlier about in the survey, it talked about, and this the kids, 40% and 20% said they didn't really, what did it say in there? You, you want to speak for that, what they surveyed? Yeah, so Hear from the kids? Yeah, Scarlett. Um, it yeah. said that I believe they weren't sure which school they preferred. I think that was the language. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. And I think SAB could take that outlet, especially yeah. with the Folsom schools, to advertise Folsom High because Vista and Folsom are both great schools, but they each have their own different things that make it great. So there's some programs that would um, that the students that live in the Vista area would like to go to Folsom High, but they don't necessarily know. Like I know one of the parents talked about the music program. Mm -hmm. So if we advertise those things or even have a day at Folsom High where we could say, come look at our different programs, come to see how our musical works, our music um, programs besides the musical or the football program, et cetera, then we could get those students who aren't sure in the elementary age or middle school age to kind of have a better idea. So, yeah, yeah I think, so that's the students speaking there. So, uh, again, I am supportive of that, but we do have to make some decisions here soon. I'm concerned about the delay. I'm concerned that we will miss and it's going to end up costing us more money down the road and logistic problems and enrollment. We got to have a timeline. We have to act fast. Hopefully, maybe you guys can go back and come up with something that is win, 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 win. Uh, but there's going to be a situation where it's not going to satisfy everyone. We we just if that's that, that's just not going to happen. But let's do the best we can. Um, also, to address somebody about the expandability of sites again, Matt knows as a facilities director, and I am an engineer. I do a lot of development. When we were building Vistula, we ran into NOA. It was natural asbestos occurring there. So anything that we build or do anything out there, we there's a whole grid system underneath that building that costs us millions of dollars more to put in. And every time you dig, you have to call a stake, even if you do a simple pipe. And if you go outside that area, you it, it costs a lot of money to even touch that ground. The city, the parks, anybody else doesn't have the same constraints because they can develop anywhere and blow up that asbestos, everybody that the kids are playing in the backyard and do it. But for us, we had the state requirements to do it. So is that correct, Matt? I remember that. So we have to be very careful. We're landlocked because of a lot of constraints and other engineering issues that we just have to consent. So to expanding, that's, you know, we can look at that, but I, I, we have a lot of constraints in that area. Uh, but again, let's come back and it's, it's hopefully December or the next meeting. Next, next meeting. meeting. We have Definitely to make meeting. a decision on the boundary change and hopefully maybe we can utilize all the energy, all this stuff that the staff came up because I really do support staff and superintendent's recommendations. Mr. Hoover. Solve budget. Oh, no. Um, I do have comments on this. So, uh, 
you know, in regards, in regards to, to the student, student survey, survey, quickly before I kind of uh, share how my feelings after the, the discussion, um, you know, I do think Eric very, uh, was it Eric? Was he the, the student that spoke? Pointed out something like college level stuff with the bias survey question. I think that was fantastic. I hope he ends up up here someday uh, because uh, that really does matter. Um, is how you ask the question, and I would have to agree with his assessment of some of those questions, uh, not even putting VISTA as an option. Um, uh, but moving into my comments, I think Casey, I believe, uh, spoke earlier, uh, and I think he hit the nail on the head um, in his challenge to the board. We cannot let ourselves be forced into action on the basis of a false dilemma. Um, I respectfully ask my colleagues to ask themselves, has the district presented a problem that demands action? If we cannot answer that with an absolute yes, then we need to pause and reconsider whether or not boundaries need to be changed at all. I know that we have been told for years that this is a problem that we have to solve, and this is the only way to solve it. But saying something over and over again does not make it true. We cannot just take anyone's word for it. We have to base our decision on the actual numbers and projections. And the numbers simply do not support the level of urgency that is being presented tonight. I will repeat myself, even though I'm starting to sound like a broken record, that the projections, our own district projections, show that VISTA would be at approximately 1,800 students at our peak. I would also like to point out that not a single member of the community has mentioned tonight that the current level of students is a problem. I received nearly 100 emails against the disruptive, a disruptive boundary change, but I received one email expressing concerns with overcrowding. I want to be clear that I am not advocating that we do nothing. I do have a plan, and here's what I propose. First, we reject any boundary change proposal, as I believe, as I believe Robert stated, it is an unnecessary nuclear option. Second, we launch an intentional and ongoing effort to better promote the diverse educational opportunities at Folsom High School. Third, we maintain the 1,900 student cap at VISTA moving forward for the foreseeable future, which will act as a default control mechanism to new neighbors that move into the community, getting back to another point that was made. Finally, and this may not be feasible, but we should work with the city to explore an out-of-the-box solution to adding portables or some other structure at Vista, including the option of using the park fields for sports and placing portables on some of the current fields on campus. I do not know if the numbers support this. I do not know if it's feasible, but I think we have a responsibility to at least explore it with the city. I respectfully ask my colleagues to listen to the community and not be forced into action based on a problem that the district's own numbers do not support. Not supporting a boundary change is not inaction. It is simply choosing not to go with a nuclear option. OK. Um, trying to look up some numbers but I, they're not at my fingertips so i guess at this direction is the board does the board want to take maybe i shouldn't have assumed that the board didn't want to take action this evening it, at this juncture is there any option that the board would like to entertain um, through a motion As I mentioned, don't have to do that. I mean, we can bring the, it the motion I would say, and it might die on, is not to throw everything out that we learned because staff and everybody, everybody, this process did bring a lot of good information, a lot of analysis, a lot of process of elimination. Knowing what is going on here, I, I've seen numbers change and boundaries change in this district and making assumptions that it's going to take care of itself. I caution the board that is not a solution. We've seen this happen. We're having lots of growth. We have new demographics, new economy coming in, new families moving in. The birth rates change. Our fee analysis change. I've seen those go up and down. It's just not going to go away. It's, it's just going to just delay it, and we're going to kick the can down the road. We do need to make some type of action, and I, I have full confidence in staff and Matt 
and everybody and the community to make that sound decision here readily. We invest a lot of time. We invest a lot of uh, information on this. We should try to make that happen soon so that we can make it a win-win situation. But just to do nothing is very, I, it's very cautious to go with that. I, I just have a problem with that. And, and, and I have a question I think that I need to clarify because I might be reading numbers wrong or I might be not looking at the same numbers, but I want to, I'd like to know where that 1800 number comes from. So Joanne, if you look at the projected enrollment resident student numbers that are in our own packet here, what page? Uh, page 19 at the bottom graph, it breaks down Cordova, all the high schools in our district and the projected res resident students, not projected enrollment students, um, the peak for Vista Del Lago High School is in 2021 at 2,251 resident students. Today, currently, according to staff, approximately 20% of our students are choosing to go elsewhere, including Folsom High and other schools in the area. If you multiply that number, if you, re you know, reduce that number by 20%, you get 1,800. Obviously, we can't see what the future is, but I'm not sure that we should make this disruptive of a change knowing that that's a possible future where we could actually be below the number we have today without voting on boundary changes. That's my point. Okay, I just want clarification where the number was because I wasn't seeing yep. it right away, yep. so thank you. Um, so I am I'm going to ask this one more time. Is there any motion that the board wants to make this evening, or do we want to continue this discussion at the next meeting with the choices coming back? Okay. I want to ask the superintendent, how much time do we have to analyze this? Because I know, Matt, when the, this is not a simple analysis. I've seen over there, he runs this through a computer modeling thing to make these numbers, doing simple linear calculations. When you have a computer, computer optimization, optimization program trying to figure this out and just even guide us, it, there's a lot of a lot of knowledge out there that can guide us better than just a simple calculation. We need to have staff and the community come up with a solution here readily quick so that we can make action because we've been delaying this for a long time. Just, just delaying, delaying another one, delaying and delaying is not a solution. We have to take action. I know it's going to be difficult decisions, but we have to make action. And so I'm asking Superintendent, how much time do we have to get this together? I mean, Matt, you, you might know. How much time do we have? We don't have a lot of time. Right. If we're going to make, um, you know, whatever the change is, we, we have, have to, to get, get our registration policies in place and approved by the board. Well, approved by the board and in place before, before January. January. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have two so more that board meetings. Your question. So if we, if we bring back the three recommendations that were... What, what are the three? The first one would, would be... be sending Blanche Sprints to Sutter and Folsom High starting that part I need a conclusion on from you. Is that in? Well, the fifth graders would start, uh, the current fifth graders would start uh, at Sutter next year. The sixth, seventh, and eighth graders would be grandfathered and be going to, to Vista del Lago. Okay. The current ones. So that's that would that's the first first option, first option that the board would like to request to Which is see. essentially one A plus the grandfathering. Which is before you tonight. You yeah. can you can actually vote on any of those that you already have the numbers. Well for. and I, I was thinking, thinking about, about making that, that motion, but out of respect to the parents at Blanche Sprints, I want them to have an opportunity, opportunity to come yeah, to the, the next, next board, board meeting and and share their their observations. <laughs> Okay, the um, second option is to um, not change boundaries. What did you have any other language? Remain, retain the current practice, or what language do you want? In um, well, you know, again, this is. Um, I think we need to la uh, launch a similar effort that we, as Matt mentioned, did back in 2010, where we, you know, created an actual campaign about encouraging students to go to Folsom High School. I don't know if we have to vote on that, uh, but that would be my uh, suggestion. So we would see the option of- And maintain the 1900 cap. Maintain the current, the current practice, cap VISTA at 1900. Do you have any language in regards to the anticipated uh, new development? 
No. Do you have, did you, clear, do you want no, no language about new homes or new? Uh, I think the 1900 cap would oh. act as that mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other one is Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills um, we, to um, Folsom Middle. Capping Vista at 1900. I'm going to get to the fourth one. Capping Vista at 1900. Strong language to assure that the six, current 6th, 7th, and 8th graders at Folsom Middle would be accepted at Vista Del Lago. And that the current 5th grade classes would be the first to be um, assigned to Folsom Hill, uh, Folsom High. And the option to school choice into Sutter. The other way is to flip it and to send them to Sutter with school choice into Folsom Middle. How would that look and if we had any latitude to send to um, have them on a clear line to Sutter? Is it possible so, to poll the board to see if there's even a majority that would agree with those two? Yeah, we can see if that works because we don't have to bring something back if we don't need to. I, I caution we're, we're, we have time. We got to have some options at the next meeting, if even it's three or four. But I, I think staff has and the community has some good ideas. It's just figure, it's run the model and put some decisions around with action. Uh, that's that's how I recommend. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think uh, if we can get the community involved as well um, to work with staff on that. With the superintendent, please. Yeah, so on. is there anything? Um, bringing back those three items for discussion some of them we already have the information on mm -hmm. um but i just don't think the board is ready to take action on any solid thing tonight unless i'm misreading i i think it needs to come back and i think we've covered everything that needs to come back and do we have a, con a, a, a and, and if we get the numbers back from matt on some of those scenarios by the next meeting then i think we'll have a a, a hybrid of what we've seen so far coming forward for us and and hopefully the numbers will work and hopefully we can address some of the issues that the the public has brought into us and can i clarify one other thing that i don't think i specified that any new development went to Folsom high in the vista boundaries yeah i hope uh, just a minute yeah. joanne before you go on i just want to clarify and manage expectations that for us to engage in something that's going to take more than a week's amount of time is not realistic to bring back on the 21st. We can continue to study and research, which we, we actually said in the report that we were going to do, especially in some of the elementary theater patterns around the parkway and so forth. But I don't want to create an unrealistic expectation of what we, you know, my staff and I <coughs> won't be able to do parts of, you know, the, the com additional community outreach you know, yeah, less than a week amount of time. Uh, but uh, and what do you mean by additional community outreach? Well, I guess I'm not clear on what the board's expectation is. Um, it, that bringing it back to the next meeting would allow the opportunity for the community to come back and speak to those options. Since we already did I mean, the outreach. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, weren't all of these proposals, with the exception of uh, applying it to current fifth graders as opposed to current eighth graders, right. I think all of these proposals have been discussed and the numbers are there. So I, I guess I just don't, I don't know what, um, what we're bringing back at this point. Um, the, the impacts of the changes you made, you proposed, 1900. Okay. The, 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 I mean, the, the, I, honestly, the, that's, that's going to change the numbers, and it's going to show a delay in reaching those numbers. Also, maybe there's a way he, uh, Matt can accelerate it after the third year. I don't know. There, it, yeah. There's well, all kinds of – after the third year, you go 100 increments. or instead of, it's He needs to run the model based well, on what we right. already know. Well, I guess the question is, is that proposal something the board would need to vote on, or is that something that, I mean, is our current 1900 cap, does that have a sunset date, or is that in, uh, you know, indefinite until until we change it again? Three-year. Three-year sunset. Okay, so that would need to be voted on. It's changing the models we have now with a, a, some of the number changes, but like Matt said, it's going to delay. Maybe you can accelerate. I, I, 
I don't know. He has, he's the expert. And it's, it's also based on assumptions and hope. And, and, and we are going to continue to market Folsom High School. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. You know, there's great opportunities at all of our schools. But some of that, the, the qualitative metrics really can't be put into a model. Mm -hmm. Sure. So with, knowing that, you know, the numbers are 2250. Right. And, and you're saying 1800, assuming that we're still transferring out. That's an assumption. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, do, we just have to be aware of yeah. that. Absolutely. And that's the part, lowering the assumptions amount. I, I really do trust staff's knowledge and the modeling they do and the numbers. I really do support the staff numbers. Well, I think it's yeah. important to point out that it's an assumption with a 1900 student cap. So we're not changing what is currently in place at Vista today. Um, so yes, it is an assumption. But if we go over 1,900, it only impacts those that small amount of students that is over 1,900. And I think that is the least disruptive option. If you keep the cap, which I don't love the cap, but if you keep the cap, and you know, obviously we can market, but even if we don't change our marketing, the cap is still in place to make sure Vista doesn't go beyond what it is today. And that, in my opinion, affects a much smaller amount of students and families than any of the other proposals on the table. Okay. So, so that, that brings uh, so, um, And I know this isn't the most popular option, but, but I, I think, think the, the option, option of assuring the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at Folsom Middle that they would get in with a cap of 1,900 and realizing that we have to make a change to eventually balance this problem, that starting Absolutely. with the fifth grade, advising them that they can either go to Sutter or Folsom Middle, but Folsom High is going to be the destination, destination for Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills. I know that's not the popular choice, but I feel that it gives the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders more protection than just saying we're going to cap it at 1900 because we have to take the new residents out of the equation too to ensure that the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders get in at that 1900. I think we have to we have to have them under the current model that we need to have language that because at 19 without that language at 1900 some of those students could be bumped out by people moving in or people coming back with school choice i think the more practical approach is to realize we have to make a change that doesn't mean that three years three years into this when it's fifth grade that this problem could have corrected itself I just think that the 1900 cap and the strong language to assure that these students get in with a viable option to make a change that will help us if it needs to in three years is the best way to go. I think we're not solving the problem if we don't um, have some sort of plan like that. But I think it will. I think the numbers will correct itself in three or four years and that we will have what I would love to see is we will have enough school choice into Vista so that anybody who wants to play lacrosse or anybody who wants to be in that guitar program or anybody who at this point wants to be in the block schedule can get in that school. And I can't see when we're going to get there. There's ways to create capacity at Vista. We can tell teachers to hot seat more. They're already hot seating 60% of the time. We can say, you know what? 80%, we're gonna drop a portable in the parking lot, that's your place to go prep, and we create space. We can change the schedule at Vista, that was in there too. It says that if we change the schedule, we can make room for 85 to 169 more students. We haven't talked about that. We're trying to, I, personally I'm trying to have a soft land, lang, landing. Staff didn't go through this, we're not going through this exercise because we don't think a change isn't needed. The change, we've been foreseeing this change for years. Something has to be done. We tried to correct the problem back in 2010, and when we ended up creating dual enrollment for Blanche Sprints and Folsom Hills, we thought we were doing the best thing for them at that time, and now we put them in this situation here. I'm, per I'm personally confident that in three years it's going to correct itself, but we need the safeguard of having language to cap that at 1900 and protect the current Folsom Middle School students over the new residents moving into that area. So maybe there's a compromise somewhere here um, that will allow us to move forward um, instead of bringing it back. But um, I, I personally, I really feel we have to do something. Go ahead. Who's next? Who, <laughs> anybody next? We do have a, a, a long, lengthy budget discussion that uh, we have to deal with after this. So we need to figure out how to wrap this up. Yeah. 
Uh, Joan, um, I, I would just simply say that if we, if the board considers uh, your third option, I, I want the board to have a very real conversation about what we're going to be doing to Sutter and Folsom High. Um, now, the other thing that, and, and I, there is one question that I would love to hear from, from um, staff on. I read something in the report that I wasn't sure if I was reading it accurately, but the block schedule at uh, Vista del Lago, mm -hmm. if the block schedule was taken away and we went to um, a, a schedule similar to Folsom High School, does that resolve the population crisis at Vista del Lago? I'm bringing that information back at the next That would meeting. be helpful yeah. to know, yeah. But um, that, again, is a negotiated item that has to do with prep time. And the numbers in the report said 84 to, I don't correct, 84 to 169, which we're talking about trying to reduce the population by 50 students a year. So it, to me, it's a factor. In the report, it wasn't a factor. But um, again, uh, so that's, you know, those, there's some things you don't want to have can, to do. Can I ask a quick question yeah. of Matt? Uh, Matt, if... Um, if we choose any of the existing proposals, but we change it to fifth grade, so you know we apply it to current fifth graders at a current seventh graders, uh, what year would we begin to see? I, if you don't know this off the top of your head, but what year do you, can, could we expect to see those numbers start to go down at Vista? Or you know, if You're saying current, current fifth, fifth graders? graders? Right, like fifth graders today. So if, right. Um, it's like three years or? Well, you're delaying it another three years. So depending on what scenario you're talking about. So are you talking about not doing any scenario at all? Leaving well, but everybody if you choose are, a, because... a boundary change scenario. Well, it uh, depends on which boundary scenario. Well, I guess if you choose any boundary change, uh, when would I know there's different levels of effect that the boundary changes have, right. but if you choose any change at all, what year would you start to see that? You well, know? in the presentation, we went through two of them, and then right. it showed on the phase implementation right. how many years with the with the Blanche Blanche sprints, sprints um, or the, uh, the was the two A one, the Folsom Hills one. Uh, we didn't get down functional capacity for at least like six years. Okay. Um, so you that, can that was that one. Now, obviously, you take more right. than you get down. That's functional capacity. That's not capping it at 1,900. 1,900, you know, you're going to be right. there right. for a few years, probably. So, I mean, it's going to be a while if we apply it to current fifth graders. I would yes. assume it would be uh, even yes. longer. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, with and I, I bring this up because it's 2019, and if we're talking about eight to nine years before we start to see any impact, I mean, that's almost a decade. It's almost a decade from now. Now, if we rewound the clock to a few years ago, I wasn't on the board, but if we rewound the clock and did it to current fifth graders then, then I might think that this is actually going to, you know, have an impact. But if we do it now, and that effect doesn't come in until 20, 27 or 28, when the numbers are already organically declining. I, I just, I'm, I'm still struggling to see how some a, a change this disruptive is beneficial to even our own problem. So I, I just, I, you know, I know I keep uh, repeating myself, but I'm just, I'm struggling to see when this, if this effect's not going to take place for a decade, I just don't see why we would do it. And I'm, and I'm still back at something needs to be done in the softest landing possible. And the best, in my opinion, it's protecting those sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at Folsom Middle, getting them into Vista, having some sort of plan that caps it at 1900, puts the, I know I'm repeating myself too, puts the new residents low on the totem pole. Um, it, it, it so I don't know if we're going to have a compromise this evening, but I see ultimately in three years this problem, three or four years, it will resolve itself. But we have to do something now to put mechanisms in work, in, in position in case it doesn't resolve itself. We tried to have it resolve itself before. And I, do, and I trust staff's analysis that we can't keep going down. The simple math is we have 
you know, two same size middle schools going into a school that takes two, 1,900 and a school that could go up to 3,000. So the, the logic says we have to divide the schools better into a feeder, in, in, into those schools. We don't have a capacity problem, we have a boundary problem. And I know that we've been talking about this for two years, it seems. Um, and I, I just don't think we're doing the community any favors by dragging it on without some sort of solution a vi some sort of viable solution that addresses it so and, and that's that comes right full circle to what i'm saying we got to take action we've been talking about this by for years i trust everybody in here to come up with a solution that matt and staff has come up with we already done the data let's run it through the let's figure out something that we can make a decision real quick because the longer we wait the longer we kick the can down the road the problem it just gets worse and worse it compounds and this assumption that it's going to take care of itself, that's an assumption. And it's not in the model. It's not what our experts say. It doesn't anything. We have experts right here in front of us. I trust staff. Matt's been doing this for years. I've, he hasn't failed us yet. And I, and I don't think, Mr. Hoover, that you and I are that far apart outside, that I, outside of the fact that I have strong, that I have language to cap it and... Um, and change the boundary, correct? Yeah. But... Um, I don't know if we're that far apart. I, I, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think uh, the difference between just a cap and you know an indefinite cap potentially is, I guess, is what I'm proposing, uh, versus a cap and a boundary change is that the and a boundary change affects more families and students. So but I it, but for three years it won't affect those students well, because we're um, we're pri we're making them a priority to we're making them a priority into Vista. The, ch the transition is a slower one with the incoming fifth graders, which by that time quite possibly would have balanced itself and opened up school choice at Vista. If we don't change boundaries, we're never going to really have school choice at Vista either. And school choice, if we're going to have school choice in the district, we should have school choice. We don't have school choice in the Vista. And we've got different programs at Vista that students want to play, like lacrosse and guitar i, I just so think we need to take care of the vista residents first and then you know it's unfortunate that our high school is too small i love school choice i wish we could have school choice but the school choice cannot be the priority over the students in the boundary it's it just, just it that's i i agree with you but we can't we can't have everything do we have any motion to move forward I already made a motion. What, what's your motion? <laughs> it's to take the existing scenarios and data and just change those the cap and the few things that we talked about in here and run the numbers and bring it back to the next board meeting so we can make a decision then. Are you including out of the new scenarios? Yeah, well, Everything that was included, correct? The best ones that we have in front of us right now, augmenting them to change the numbers. And you'll see what Matt's saying. It just delays it so we we need to see those numbers i i don't i don't have any numbers in front of me if you're making these changes i want to see that our experts run a model for us to see what it looks like if we don't have it in front of us we can't make a decision so i think to, to simple point to that to bring it back i think we need to see staff say you know what 1900 we get those students in our um i think maybe we do need to bring back the two um options that we are throwing out here three so, three the blanche sprints um to um sutter and Folsom <laughs> high as well so i i i it doesn't seem to me like we're going to get to this conclusion tonight and we're talking the same thing over and over again in circles so i'm adding a to be continued so you're basically tabling any action then and, and, then and, and staff to bring back the three, three those three as long as staff is perfectly clear after all this what those are <laughs> so we'll make sure it is so so all right all right stay tuned
We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to say, say something, something about continuing the meeting now. <laughs> okay. We'll wait till the crowd clears. I don't have it. Rhonda, you want to drive? Okay, I'm going to get on with the meeting because we have like a 30 page budget report. So um, I'm not going to wait for that. M moving on to our discussion item, Ron, Ms. Cro uh, Superintendent. Yes, we're continuing this discussion on our bu budget study session analysis um, ongoing from last uh, budget study session on October 24th. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, tonight, we're taking a deeper dive into the impacts that have been generated by our stakeholder groups, and we'll have a preview of recommendations for November 21st. And next steps, steps after, after that, that is that the board would be adopting formal recommendations for budget reductions for the following year. We'll get into more of the specifics of that in just a moment. I just want to remind us of our guiding principles. Um, we are directed by the county office to reduce our expenditures, our ongoing expenditures with ongoing revenue to the tune of over $5 million for next school year. I'm not done. Uh, minimize potential layoffs, <laughs> minimize impact to students, which is key, I didn't want to miss that, and review our programs. Now you can go to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this is, I can't emphasize this enough, and for those of you that are joining us here for the first time, this is discussion we've been having at every single meeting when we're talking about the budget. And we've had many, and we'll show you those dates in just a moment. But what's at stake if our board cannot make this decision by the next meeting is potentially the county office rejecting our budget, and there are many negative consequences of that. And as the uh, county superintendent has said, those ongoing reductions cannot be counted on with one-time fixes. They have to be ongoing with ongoing revenue. Ongoing reductions offset by ongoing revenue. So that's key. And I just want to make sure everyone hears that and we're all on the same page with that. First interim, interim budget reporting has to be done prior to December 15th, which is the urgency, but we didn't just start this process. Going to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the implications of negative certification on our budget. Ms. Crawford. So some of those implications are, are listed up here. As Dr. Kligian said, the, the biggest thing coming up for us is with first interim. SCOE has made it clear if we do not meet their requirements, there is a very strong chance that they will disapprove our budget. Um, and that follows with a fiscal advisor that they will put in place. Um, if it goes further into um, second interim and into our adopted budget where we have a new third year and we go into negative certification. Um, there's many more implications and those um, actually fall into not only our internal, um, but also starts affecting our taxpayers, our bond ratings and the future of our building program with uh, South of 50. So this is just, we've seen the slide before. The biggest reason why we are still talking about why we have a budget deficit. Um, the, the main reason is our ongoing increases each year are more than the revenue that we receive from the state. Um, we've outlined some of those um, increases here. Um, there are some programs that we are mandated, mandated to, to provide, provide that we receive no funding for. Um, on top of our ongoing Annual expenditures were about three times more what we receive in revenue. Our revised budget projections that we brought to the board in August, our 1920 year, we were showing a slight deficit of a little over $100,000. Um, we believe we've solved that with, we have some additional funding that we identified from our unaudited actuals um, in September 
for the 2020-21 year, we are showing about 3.2, a little bit more in terms of a deficit. Again, we have a structural deficit. We have more expenditures than we do revenue. Um, in the adopted budget, we identified $3.5 million in one-time fixes. That got us to qualified status, um, which is why um, SCOE, in their approval of our, our budget, pointed that out, and they pointed out in the third year, if we meet the 3.5, we still have a $5.5 million uh, deficit in 21-22. Um, without making any changes, um, that compounding continues, and it's over $10 million that we will be short in 21-22, and we will then be in negative status. And this does not include any salary increases. This is just strictly our current year expenditures and our current year revenues. So this just is a graphic uh, illustration that shows our current year, the reductions that we've made for the 2021 year, we had three and a half million dollars that we were projecting as a shortfall. If we do not go with the proposed changes we made at adopted budget, and that compounds into 21-22, that adds to the five and a half million dollar shortfall that we had identified at 21-22. Um, going into 22-23, we have a new third year, so that three and a half continues plus the five and a half continues plus. We have a $9 million shortfall on top of that, so we're looking at almost $20 million if we do nothing. Again, that doesn't account for any salary increases, um, and we've identified what the cost of 1% would be for each group. So for any salary increases, that would be multiplied by the percentage. This is a list of ideas and thoughts that came out of our budget study sessions last year. We held four of them. Um, this came out from all groups that attended. Um, we, we discussed some of these um, during each of those sessions. We have continued those discussions, and Dr. Kligian will talk a little bit more about those. Um, we tried to supply um, dollar amounts with those as we moved into this year and continued with our study session and with our meetings with our stakeholders. So far, um, this year, we've been engaging our, our bargaining units, our different stakeholder groups, our students through the Student Advisory Board from September through October. And then as you can see, our uh, fifth budget study session was on October 24th. And tonight, we're diving deeper on the impacts of some of those that received the mixed support. And then November 21st, our board will need to approve uh, budget reductions for next year. So Ms. Crocker can submit a report to the county by December 13th, and then staffing projections ensue after that for January. We've been working collaboratively with our bargaining groups, and I thank them for that and, and the um, uh, interactive process we've had with them and with FCLA as well. Just uh, illustrative, the study sessions that we've had since last November um, and the different stakeholder meetings, continuing on. And these are the meetings that have taken place with our different bargaining groups, student advisory, our leadership team, with our board, reports to the, in the public. So these are all the different um, times we've been talking about our budget this year. So this was a slide that we brought at our study session at the last board meeting. This is the feedback that we received from all of those groups that were on the previous slide that we have been meeting with. This was, we had asked each of those groups to rank um, ideas that had been brought forward. These items here, I won't read all of them to you. These were ones that were, um, for the most part, a broad support across all the groups. So all of them together are a little over $3 million. Um, there's a couple that are one time in nature. Um, I won't read all of them to you. If there's any questions as I go along, uh, we can entertain those, but I think we answered those the last time. This next slide, this was feedback that, that really generated no support from any, any of our groups. Um, I don't wanna say that these are completely off the, the table. table. They would probably, we could keep them on the back burner. We could consider them at a later time. Um, these are about 2.4, $2.5 million. This is a, a little larger list. This was a mixed support across all of our groups. 
and we've identified the dollar amounts to each of these items. It's almost $5 million that we've identified here. Um, we have some slides coming up that uh, provide more detail. Uh, staff or board had asked staff to provide some additional detail, so we will we'll walk through some of the larger items and those that affect uh, FTE. Again, this was mixed support. This was the next year out, so this would have been 21-22. The dollar amounts here add up to $3.7 million. One of the questions that came out of the mixed support slide was we had identified some staffing reductions here in this building, the Education Services Center. So what, we've, what we tried to do was list what we're looking at, what the factors are that we're considering, what we lose, what we gain from um, these staffing reductions. So we've listed them out here for you. We listed what we have already put into place. We made some uh, reductions this year. So we are continuing to look at um, efficiencies in this building, looking at our operations, we're looking at vacant positions. We're evaluating where we are. Um, we have identified uh, an, a, one director position and two classified moving forward. That would give us a savings of about $250,000, and that would be ongoing in reductions. Mr. Wilson's going to talk about the restructuring of lead teachers. Right. Th this um, topic also was on the mixed support list um, for the following, for next year. Um, Following the same guidelines here, we talked about factors being considered, what we sacrifice, what we gain. Um, going over the factors being considered, we currently, these are kind of facts, currently we have seven lead teachers. Uh, we have completed our English language arts and math adoptions um, for the next several years. Um, it also, there's an opportunity to shift from content area specialists that we currently have to more of a curriculum instruction K-12 specialist. And currently another factor that doesn't seem quite related, but it will at the end of this um, topic. We currently have 40 um, professional learning community implementation coaches across 20 sites that receive stipends, um, which factor into the total savings of equal about $90,000. So what we would sacrifice is targeted professional development. Um, last year, or over the last few years, since 2015, we've uh, the lead teachers have provided over 22,000 hours to our teachers across the district. Um, we would also sacrifice the continued um, current level of support for our guaranteed and viable curriculum um, as we are currently staffed and their ability to reach all staff. Um, and support of the PLC implementation designated at each site. Again, that goes back to those 40 PLC implementation coaches at each site. Uh, what we gain, um, a restructuring um, from seven lead teachers to four uh, curriculum K-12 uh, instructional instruction specialists, including the PLC implementation. Uh, K-12 curriculum instruction specialists would have specialty training to support varied needs at the sites and an opportunity for site-based leadership and collaboration. Um, this model would lead to an ongoing savings of $500,000 compounded over the next several years. And was that a suggestion of the lead teachers as well? So how we got to this, yes, yes the, the original, original proposal um, to to get to $500,000 was simply to go from seven lead teachers to two lead teachers. Um, and meeting with the lead teachers and meeting with other stakeholder groups, um, several proposals were brought forward. A hybrid model of several of those, taking pieces of, um, of all those, got us to reduce to four. Um, look at some training that is in the budget for leads. Um, also looking at the implementation coaches uh, and those stipends that are paid out and put those responsibilities on the four remaining and that does equate to five hundred thousand dollars thank you and before i go on to the next slide if i can add you know whatever changes are made this isn't we're one and done we we will continue to work with the impacted groups for putting um, viable systems in place for the following year so we would continue to work with Jim Huber and our lead teachers and um, work through what that plan looks like. Okay, moving on to the next one, the consolidation of our alt-ed um, programs, um, closure of Folsom Lake High School and re redirection to other alt-ed options. First of all, I wanna say there's a lot of numbers on this slide and I wanna start by saying we realize that Folsom Lake High School is serving 
um, social emotional well-being of students and that's that's critical and I heard that loud and clear from our staff and I've seen that when I've visited the site and and, and seen you know what our staff do with our students and and dialoguing with our students too but we're all lo also looking at other opportunities where we might be able to serve those students needs in possibly um, another setting that might be more efficient and what brings us to that is looking at the numbers. So we have 55 students currently enrolled, and according to um, leadership, would we know that 24 are planning to graduate in 2020, which is great. Um, the approximate cost per student is over 18,000. The revenue we get per ADA is about half that amount. The student to teacher ratio is 13 to one. Um, there are other alt ed options I existing in the district in other uh, places. Uh, the ILS program, our 18 to 22 year old um, special ed program is also located there. Uh, at one time they were located at Walnut Wood and Walnut Wood would, if um, this is approved, then they would go back to Walnut Wood. And from staff, they said that would be a benefit to them because the students have more access for the work, workability and accessing businesses, not only in Rancho Cordova, but Sacramento too. What we sacrifice are those additional options for students who require that alternative learning environment, um, potential loss of some of our students to out of district programs such as options for youth. We talked about that with staff um, and potentially 11 employees could be impacted, uh, but we have the potential to absorb those FTE uh, through attrition and, um, and, and looking at retirements as well. What we gain in that total model is about 500,000. We're looking at other ways to think, reimagining how we can continue to serve the needs of a very special population of students. Um, we're looking at credit recovery. We realize independent study alone will not help, but it's, it's an option to catch up a little quicker. And we're calling it a hybrid model where there would be face-to-face -face instruction. So it'd be a little bit different than what we do offer at Walnut Wood but we would have um, an online platform to help with that credit recovery. Uh, so that's what that hybrid um, model looks like. And what we're saying is uh, a model that would offer lab time, that face-to-face -face time at least two days per week. And looking at relocating this at, uh, as a, a small school within a school at Folsom High School and the reason Folsom High School is there are opportunities for um, career pathways, elective pathways, and new opportunities with the new manufacturing building and project-based learning and, and workability uh, for these students as well. We realize that um, accessing mental health support and services is critical, and that will still be a priority for the students um, offered at Folsom High and opportunities, as I said, to participate in the pathways and more credit recovery options um, for students that enrolled at Folsom High as well. So it could go and grow beyond um, the existing students that are there initially. And Mr. Ogden's gonna address this slide. Okay. Hey, Sarah, um, sorry, do we do we wanna save questions till the end? I'm just clarifying how we're, yes. can we, you wanna get yeah. through this and then? Yes, okay. that would be great, thank you. Okay, I was gonna share uh, this slide, which is prep periods at Mills and Mitchell. Um, currently, we have uh, two different models at our middle schools. The Folsom Middle Schools, uh, Sutter and, and Folsom Middle have a six period schedule. Uh, Mitchell and Mills have a seven period schedule. Our contract language um, allows our, our uh, teachers to have 175 student contacts mm -hmm. a day. So what happens is we um, end up having one prep period for teachers and uh, Folsom and Sutter Middle School and two prep periods a day for teachers at Mitchell and Mills. Um, as a result of that, when we staff these schools, we actually need more teachers to staff the same amount of students. Um, the real easy math to look at it is you look at the number of students, and in order to meet our contract, we have a, a, a divisor of 29.5 for the Folsom schools, the divisor is 25 for the uh, Rancho Cordova schools. So there's a difference there in, uh, in our staffing ratios. And so the, um, the uh, issues that come up are you know, unequal preps across the district. And also, if, uh, if a student has a core class in, uh, in Folsom or Sutter Middle School, their typical class period is 52 minutes. 
because there's more periods at um, Mitchell or Mills, their class period's 46 minutes. So there's a difference in time for, uh, for a period uh, of instruction. Um, what we sacrifice if we were to go from a seven period, two prep day to a six period, one prep day is a unique uh, scheduling options for some students. Uh, this would create a, uh, the word here is a surplus, not a layoff, a surplus of teachers at two sites. Surplus meaning that we have the ability to uh, have positions for them within the school district uh, at this time. And so that's about 10 positions that we do have. Uh, typically on a typical year, we have about 30 retirees in the district. We typically have about 20 people who come in new and they either non-reelect or they, they think this isn't the career for them because we typically hire about 100 people a year. So we should, we should have plenty of room for these, uh, these staff members to teach in their subject area. Um, the, uh, a sacrifice here is, uh, is Mills. Mills right now just changed from an eight period to a seven period day. So this would be three years in a row changing their period. They would go eight, seven, six. Um, another uh, impact uh, would be on the MYP program, which we have at Mitchell. Um, the six period model is used at MYP schools throughout the state. So it's eight, you're able to do that, but it's an uncertain impact on exactly how that would play out. Um, I know that our uh, IB MYP coordinator has looked at this and there's a couple of different options uh, that, that could make this work, but uh, this would be working together with both of these staffs to make sure that you know, we, we, uh, we put this, these changes in place in a way that would maintain the programs and the uniqueness that we have on those two uh, sites. Um, ongoing savings, it's a big number. It's over $800,000. It's a lot of teachers uh, that we would, you know, we would still have on staff. They would just be teaching in other roles. Um, we would have a fewer student uh, transitions in a six period day than a seven period day. Uh, we also have an opportunity to create uh, learning time across the district. And uh, that's consistent because as I said earlier, uh, we have more minutes um, at Folsom and Sutter than we do at Mitchell and Mills in a core period. It also gives us an opportunity to allocate uh, funding per student based on a standardized funding formula. When I currently work to staff schools, I use a different formula depending on the school. So this, this helps us long term uh, with our funding formulas. Mr. Wilson's going to address this slide. Absolutely. This discusses the standardization of kindergarten schedules across the district to an AMPM model. Um, the factors being considered are um, physical education minutes are actually not mandated um, for kindergartners. Actually, kindergarten itself is optional um, in the state of California. And however, school districts do uh, must offer kindergarten. Uh, currently, six schools already utilize the AMPM um, schedule. The current slip sessions utilized by nine of the sites mirror the same minutes as the AMPM models, which is 201 instructional minutes. Um, seven sites currently utilize the extended day schedule, and what that looks like is it mirrors the first and second grade early late schedules. Uh, teachers in an AMPM model uh, would have the ability to take their prep during their non-student rostered time, and what that means is in an AMPM model, um, for the majority of the day, there are actually two teachers in the room with 24 students. Now those students change um, halfway through the day to a different 24 and the teacher is only the rostered um, teacher of record during one of those um, sections of students. When it's not their section, if I am the AM teacher, when I am assisting the um, PM teacher, that is when I could take a prep and we're still within a ratio of a one to 24 ratio for CSR. What we sacrifice in this is a school's ability to be flexible in their scheduling of kindergarten for what works best for them, their staff, their students, and their, the community. Um, physical education being taught to kindergarten students by a specialist is another sacrifice that we would have. Our physical education specialists um, are experts in their field, um, and they know their standards for um, providing that education to students for gross motor fine motor skills um, through physical education play. Um, extended time for students enrolled in the extended day schedules. So those students who are um, over the 201 minutes currently um, would be reduced down to 201 minutes. Uh, what we gain is the alignment of kinder schedules across the district, which has been coming up year after year after year. Um, the inequities of whether I have room or don't have room um, has been something that we've been working with the bargaining group and kindergarten teachers across the district for several years now, including a 
um, uh, actually a, a large contingency of teachers across the district this year and last year had been meeting on a regular basis to discuss the standardization of kindergarten schedules. Um, the savings is 3.5 FTE in the form of PE specialists. Um, what we gain, also a gain there would be facility space for future programs and growth. Currently, if we're not utilizing an AMPM model and we have two kindergarten cl classes, it uses two classrooms. Those two would be combined into one classroom. Okay, restructuring funding for special friends, Ms. Wessinger. Okay, so the Special fin Friends program is a long-standing program. program in the district. The factors that are being considered is a possible increase in the site contribution for the program. So on average right now, the district is paying nearly 60% uh, of the cost of the program from district funds. The remaining 40% cost of the program comes from Title I dollars, first five grant dollars, and school site budgets. When the program was implemented, we did not have other programs available to address social emotional needs. And in recent years, we've added PBIS, second step curriculum, SEL guiding principles, mental health specialists, social workers. And uh, Special Friends is a pull out program. So uh, there's two different programs that child children receive. They are pulled out for um, during a 12 week cycle. They're either pulled out one on one for 30 minutes a week in a playroom setting, or they're pulled out in small groups for 45 minutes a week to receive the second curriculum instruction. Uh, what we sacrifice is special, as I said, Special Friends is a longstanding program that has been historically successful. Just last year, 86% of the students who participated in the program showed growth, growth in one or more areas. We also sacrifice that one-on-one -on -one support that the students receive in that small in that playroom setting. Possible staff reduction would come from uh, the if we increase the site contribution. Some sites may choose not to participate in the program. So right now, for example, most of our sites are offering 10 hours a week mm -hmm. of the program. So the site contribution for 10 hours a week is three thousand dollars. If the site pays for the full cost of the program, the cost of the program is about $13,500. We have, so if there was a reduction into the program due to staff choosing, or schools choosing not to participate, we could have a possible staff reduction. There are 4.2 classified staff who are, uh, I'm sorry, 4.2 classified FTE, they're range 13, and a 0.2 school psychologist reduction possible. What we gain is the opportunity for the students to access the multi-tiered system of supports in general education setting, including PBIS, the second step curriculum that's now being taught in the classroom um, and was purchased new this year, SEL guiding, access to the SEL guiding principles, um, and we also of course have the mental health specialists and the social worker supports. Restructuring summer school, Mr. Wilson. Yes, and I want to emphasize that this does not uh, include a yes, why, as stated up on the on the top there. So the factors being considered in this one, um, uh, and we have been looking at this in the in the past recent years, is the um, a more effective and rigorous credit recovery models do exist that better serve students' learning um, needs rather than the four week half day structure that we have currently been employing in our um, high schools at this time. Online credit recovery options at Court of High School and Folsom High School using Edgenuity and or Apex. Um, and at the added expense with no revenue received from ADA for summer school. Um, as you might recall, we did not offer summer school in, a, in the traditional model for middle schools last year or elementary schools. Um, what we sacrifice is the traditional model of summer school that I just spoke about um, and the short-term solution for learning gaps. The things we gain here are the increased focus on school year embedded interventions. Uh, many of our high schools have been implementing schedules that allow for students to do some credit recovery on those campuses. Those that don't currently have that model, we would have to retain um, some type of credit recovery system throughout the summer, um, which is what lowered our ongoing savings here a little bit. I'll discuss that in a few seconds. Um, increased rigor and instructional targeted to the individual students' needs rather than sitting in the four-week summer school class. Um, the students through the 
um, credit recovery systems, um, such as Edge Annuity or Apex, it would be targeted to their exact needs. And when they recover what they need to, they would be done uh, rather than sit through the whole four weeks. Flexible options for students depending on the academic needs is what I just spoke about. And the ongoing savings of approximately $200,000 was reduced a bit from a little over $300,000 um, due to the fact that we would still have to offer this for the high schools that do not have this embedded in their schedule still. Uh, more localized control and the re uh, reduce the need for additional administrator for summer school. Currently, when we run the traditional model, um, we staff it with a summer school administrator. That would not be necessary in the, uh, in the online recovery method. Um, it could take place at the high schools while the current administrators were still working during the summertime. And another idea that came up through our stakeholder meetings was exploring an early retirement incentive similar to the one we did with our certificated units um, and exploring that for classified and confidential. So Mr. Ogden's going to share a little bit about that. Well, you're familiar with this because we did this last year with FCEA. This is something we'd like to entertain with CSEA and our confidential staff. Um, I think we built a lot of trust with our, with our FCEA members when we went through this because we were able to do some position reductions. However, we didn't, in, we didn't reduce people. Uh, we also were able to offer incentives to some of our valued employees who'd worked for a long time and give them a bit of a golden handshake as they, uh, as they retired. Um, we were also able to do this in a timely manner so that we were able to give people choice on where they could land uh, on some of the positions that we collapsed. So um, this would be something that would be a little bit more technical with CSEA and confidential. Uh, where we work with teachers, we might have someone, someone who has, has a general ed credential and there's lots of positions that they could fill in our elementary schools, whereas we have many uh, positions that are one to 10 uh, unit members uh, in our in our bargaining that CSEA and confidential so it, it's a little more tech technical than the other one but I think we can uh, make some reductions in positions and not uh, necessarily need to lay off people so. so at this time we'll entertain um, questions from the board um, just in preparation for our next steps for no November 21st so we do want to hear from the board and from our public tonight and know that we will continue to dialogue with those impact of staff, families, and students, knowing that we have to make um, a recommendation to the board of ongoing reductions of 5.5 million by November 21st. Okay, so any um, board member questions? Yeah, I had a question for Don. Um, the uh, IBMYP program, and it, you, you say, say it's, it's a certain impact, I mean, it was the planning on going away are you making adjustments what are you no, doing there's no plan on it going away in this plan this would just be we would have to determine how we get all the IB uh, and what's well, the MYP the right. MYP class is done in a year and there were three different options that uh, that I looked at with with some staff members that they were already brainstorming how they could make this work on a six period day some of our neighboring districts that offer MYP in the middle school years mm -hmm. uh, offer a six period day Okay, okay. And then the Folsom Lake High School students. Now, you're looking at a credit recovery program and you're looking at enrolling them in Folsom High School. Is that going to be full time, part time? How is that going to look? They would be an extension of Walnut Wood Independent Study, but it would look different than the independent study that we currently have at Walnut Wood. And I, I know um, Ms. Conover and our principal at Folsom High School, Howard Caden, had been talking about options to make this work at Folsom High School. But it, it would be another arm or satellite of, and a different format of okay. Walnut Wood. So it'd be under the Walnut Wood umbrella. Gotcha. All right. Um, any other board questions? Mr. Reed. Um, I have a, um, a number of questions that I, I want to walk through. Um, do we know how much we spend on outside legal counsel annually? Yes. I can, I can tell you what we budgeted for this year. I didn't bring previous years, but I have it. Six hundred. What did I say? Six hundred eighty-five. Six ninety-four. Six ninety-four for this current year. Four thousand is what we budgeted. Um, 
I really think that the district needs to entertain bringing on a general counsel. Um, we could s absorb the salary based on the savings alone and also come away with additional savings. Having an inside general counsel on staff would manage whatever outside legal counsel we potentially would need, but would eliminate the need for a lot of outside legal counsel. Um, I, I, I would like the district to at least entertain that uh, as, a, as a possibility. Um, now, granted, it's another employee, but I, like I said, I think the savings would come from it. Um, the restructure of the lead teachers, I, I, I think that, that makes sense. Um, Chromebook. Um, the first time that students need to uh, have um, assessments taken uh, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is third grade. Is, is that? State assessment. State assessment. Is there a possibility that we can take the technology out of K, kindergarten and first grade um, and not have to maintain a one-on-one -on -one ratio um, for those grades and, and create additional savings? That It's a possibility. And matter of fact, it's part of the four-year tech plan that Ms. Harrison has been reviewing. Our district adopted a one-to-one -one policy a few years back, which is why we have one Chromebook per student and then some. Uh, so yes, we would entertain um, the board re-looking at that one-to-one -one initiative that gave you gave direction to the staff at that time and look at maybe revising it for K-2. And, and could we see the, the savings that that would generate? Yes, we would, the proposal that would, that would um, propose a, a different ratio for various grade levels would absolutely come with the the dollar needed to get us to those ratios and in return show a savings and, and the reason why I say k1 rather than k2 um, is because I, I see the, the the potential value of having second graders get comfortable with the Chromebooks mm -hmm. so that in third grade when they're taking the assessments it's not a new instrument that they're not familiar with Correct. so um, Folsom Lake uh, High School um, closure, I, and I think that I think I got my answer here. So the students from Folsom Lake that would be on the Folsom High School campus would not be students of Folsom High School. They would be officially classified as students of Walnut Wood. Right. Okay. Um, I was curious, and I don't want to put the union on the spot, but I'll, maybe I will. Um, uh, does the union have a position on losing a prep period by going from seven to six um, at Mills and Mitchell, which would generate the 828,000 savings? You know it's late. You don't have to, you don't have to go on. What's that? You will need to come to the podium. I'm just going to ask you to repeat it again. Sorry. Um, does the union have a position on if we went from seven to six periods at Mills and Mitchell uh, that would generate the 828,000 annual savings? Um, does the union have a position on losing that uh, extra prep period at those two schools? Our main goal is saving FTEs. So that's just where we're at across the board. Okay. Thank you. Um, question on the, the, the AM PM, is there a reason why we have to cut PE if we go to an AM PM schedule uh, across the, the district? So right now, um, why that results in savings is currently regardless of schedules, um, teachers are provided prep time for the contract by um, a specialist, whether that is music and PE, a combination of that in fourth and fifth grade on down to PE from third down to K. Um, if we were to consolidate the, the schedules we, by having two teachers in the room at a time, they could prep each other, basically, right. which would cut out the need for a PE specialist, specialist to, to come, come in. in. What's currently happening in the AMPM models is each of those teachers receives a prep during the week or two preps, they're 60 minutes. Um, so if you can imagine AMPM when 
if I'm the AM and I'm getting my prep, well, by default, so does the PM teacher. And then when the PM teacher gets their prep, by default, so does the AM teacher. Um, so we're actually double prepping the teachers right now in AMPM models. That's just how it's set up by teacher receiving prep. In that model, the PE specialist would not, not be necessary, necessary or regardless of what specialist, we wouldn't need another body in there to, pre to do the prep time. All right, um, I understand that, but could we go to an AM and PM and keep the PE? There would be no savings in, in FTE at that point. I understand, but if we decide- Teachers deliver the PE? Oh, yes, I, the, P, the PE, yes, teachers could absolutely deliver PE at that point. We wouldn't lose, per se, physical education in kindergarten. We would lose it being taught by a specialist. Okay. Um, I, I like the special friends program, and I would not like to see that go away. Um, I agree. I'm almost at my end here. Um, all right, so if we drop summer school, could students opt to take summer school classes through other sources? Yes. So non-district sources, we would allow that. That is that has always been an an, um, an option throughout. Yes, and some of them are paid options, um, but we we do want to offer them options through Apex or Edgenuity um, through us as well. Okay. And um, my last one is just an observation. I like the early retirement savings. That's it. Mr. Hoover. Okay, I'll try to go fast. Um, let's see here. Um, Folsom Lake, I think my question is about the ILS program. I'm just trying to get some clarity. Um, that program's moving to Walnutwood. Would it, would it be the same program, just at a different site? Or would it be shifted to some sort of independent study? No, it would be the same program. In okay. fact, the program was at Walnutwood right, and was moved yeah. to Folsom okay. Lake High School. And so there are currently three classrooms. There are about 37 students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And right now the makeup is about uh, 1918. So about half of them are from okay. Folsom and half of them are from Rancho. So the three teachers, the three classes, the okay. students would all go to Walnutwood. So, so the families and the parents can will still be able to depend on the services yes. and everything okay yes. i just that that was uh that was a great program so thank you for that clarification um would losing i know there's been some concern raised about losing some students to options for youth for example would that um loss in ada this might be a dumb question but would that have a negative would that reduce the savings that we would gain from the the shift or the closure i should say potentially well, the cost per student right now is a bit over 18000 The revenue we get if they're there every day is about half of that. Okay. So that answers. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, thanks for that. Uh, is there a ballpark dollar figure for FT for the savings with the AMPM change? Yes, um, it, it would reduce the need for about 3.5 FTE and PE teachers. So if we think of an FTE on average, including benefits, it's about $100,000. So $350,000 is the projected savings. Okay, great. Um, I, you know, I'll also just kind of express some concern about eliminating this, or I should say reducing the support for the Special Friends Program. Um, you know, I, uh, I think you know, we definitely run the risk of, well, I guess the question would be, do we know or have we polled the sites to see if if they would keep the program based on this? Is that something that we've talked to anyone about? I, I have not specifically okay. gone back, but I can tell you that um, over the years, the sites increase their hours and they decrease their hours. And so every time there's a change in the hours, their cost of their con contribution goes up and down. So for example, um, I use the 10 hour example and the contribution is $3,000. Mm -hmm. It's 1,500 per every, every five hours. So if they want 15 hours, they're gonna pay $4,500. If they want 10 yeah. hours, they pay. So it's not unusual for a site to increase or decrease their hours based on how much they're comfortable contributing to, based on their site contribution. Yeah, I, I do. I think that'd be the one proposal that I, I definitely have some concern about. Um, and and so I guess moving on to a, a couple other questions, uh, I don't want to freak Chris out because I'm not advocating for anything specifically here. But, you know, one of the interesting things about going through the boundary uh, background packet was kind of seeing the um, students that choose to choice into Cordova High 
And I know the IB program was one of the, you know, one of the goals of the IB program was to get more kids to go to Cordova potentially. Um, has IB, and I may be, this may have been brought up in a previous meeting, but has it been run by stakeholders in terms of continuing that program? Uh, I, again, I'm not advocating for anything specific here. I'm just curious if it's been discussed. It, it has come up in our different stakeholder meetings, questions about it. And I think what we find is people see, uh, people that are not aware of what IB is about and what mm -hmm. it's done for um, creating a different level of um, expectation for our students at Cordova High, as well as creating a deep level of professional development for the teachers over the last five years, is if you're not directly involved with that program and you just see the number of yeah. the price tag, you sure. don't understand the impacts. But there have been a lot of positive okay. impacts from the program. So it has come up, but different questions um, depending on the level of knowledge of IB. And some folks just wondering, has it made yeah. an impact at all? And so we've been sharing more of that data with the groups that have asked okay. that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the last question is, and forgive me if I missed it somewhere, but are we still talking about iReady? Uh, what is the, is there any update on that? Yeah, that we're looking at iReady too, and uh, we're looking at when it the license right. comes due, and and looking at some other options. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. Did you have anything? Yeah. I didn't get to you. I didn't. I didn't want to sound redundant. But I support a lot of what the, our, my colleagues are saying. Uh, I know we're going to get a scenario. We're going to plug these in and see what the compounding numbers will be. So. You know, the friends group, I know that one seems to be near to my heart, too, because it's the emotional part of how we address uh, a lot of things that the folks have been talking about. But I know you're going to run the numbers. I know we're going to look at it. Will these here get us compound in the three-year or just two-year or just this year? It depends on what you approve. So, I mean, collective. Say if we approve all of these right now. With the exception of friends. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of these, are, they, they're really good ideas. There we are. They're consolidating if, them. If we were, if the board were to approve all the mixed support, mm -hmm. um, and I believe a couple other items, yes, we would, we could meet our financial obligations for all three years. Thank you. But that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, so for summer school, I understand that the district supports students with outside organizations for credit recovery. Does that include um, additional courses that students want to take that they can't take during the traditional school year? I'm looking at our counselors out here, seeing if anybody's nodding yes. I believe it would, it would be completely dependent upon the course and if it's also an accredited course. Is that and I think I, I'm speaking for Catherine, she's not here, but I, I, to use an example, um, I believe that quite a few students actually take the health course mm -hmm. during the summer because they want to be able to take music and other programs. Right, so that would still continue? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, are you done? I didn't want you. Um, as long as health and summer school came up, I know that a lot of kids take health over the summer but it's, um, I want to know if that could be considered an enrichment, if they could pay for that, to pay, to, if we can charge the students who want to take health for the summer school for that. Um, I don't know if we can. I'd like to know if, if I think that and PE is one of the other ones that we offer over summer school. If we don't offer summer school, could we charge for those programs and possibly generate some revenue? Um, I'd like to see us continue to make progress on reducing that summer school co cost. Um, um, I, I, I trust staff has worked well with FCEA and that these proposals are, uh, ex, you know, the direction that they want to go. I do have concerns about the integrity of the IB program at Mitchell. I would really love to see more of a uh, definition of how we're going to condense and in what uh, disciplines we're going to put together and how we're going to reduce that and still make it um, a, a strong program. Um, you don't have to answer right now, but you know, bringing it back next time as long as I could be reassured of that. You're saying that Churchill does, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So if the rest, if, you know, just next time is fine. If someone wants to speak to that real quick right now, I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. If he wants. 
while Dan is coming up, um, Catherine just texted. She's watching the live stream. Hi, um, Catherine. <laughs> and basically, she wanted to make sure we understood that we we would not be supporting the enrichment for summer school, but ma mainly the credit, credit recovery, recovery options. But I'd like to still know if we could offer that as a service through our district. We might get other districts paying for summer school. Definitely look into it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. How you? Problem. How's Hi. the program going to look? Hi, uh, Dan Inkle at Mitchell Middle School, and uh, OG for IB. All right, um, we have a, a, a program of MYP. It's an eight content area program. It's in seven periods right now, and what we did at Mitchell a couple years ago, we did have an eight period day. The eight period day was a contract violation and. Zandy was one of our teachers when that was happening. So they came up with a way to incorporate one of the content areas called design into art. And it didn't work real well. The MYP people said it was okay, but could we come up with a better idea for their, um, their accreditation visit, which is coming up this coming fall. And so we put it into science. And with the science NGSS standards, with that engineering uh, standard, it works out pretty well. And uh, the um, Deb and the union have done some good work with our uh, science teachers. We, uh, we're teaching one unit this year. Um, and it seems to be working out okay. I think it's something that's doable, and so the seven period is working. The the six period day, although doable, you know, and there are some schools that have it. It does impact the program, and we're looking at uh, how we would go and fold another uh, content area into another content area. And there are just some parameters in IB that make it difficult, like having a uh, a continuity of over the course of a year. It would be great if we could treat it like driver's ed and health, and have art one semester and Spanish the next semester, but we just can't do that. It, they just don't allow it. So you have to come up with ways to uh, incorporate it. Like I said, with design and science, it worked out pretty well. It's, it's a pretty good match. But um, taking a, our art course and, I don't know, merging it with, say, language arts uh, and come, you know, it's, you know, maybe uh, we're looking at maybe every other quarter. We could do that over the course of the year. So like, quarter one and quarter three and quarter two and quarter four, but the continuity just, you know, we're just basically batting it around. We do have three options and I didn't know if they were shared with you. We, we did a little bit of research on that and we're looking at the three options is trying to figure out which one would be best for for uh, um, a six period day. So as long as I know that uh, you and Amy and are confident that the integrity of the program will be maintained and that right. we could still, because we don't, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not. I'll, I'll support it, but I just want to express my concern that I want to make sure this is, you know, a good, good quality program. I, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah, Reed. and the, to answer your question, um, that that's a tough question to answer right now. That that integrity part, because how are we going? We're just trying to figure out what a program is going to have to suffer. It's only going to get half of what it's getting right now, um, and so that's what we have to look at. Like, how are we going to do that? and uh, do it with fidelity and make sure it works at a high level, you know, because uh, we're very proud and uh, believe in what we have going on right now. Mr. Reed? If you went from a seven period to a six period, but you created a zero period, would that help at all? You know, we, we were talking about that um, after your visit and we mapped out a, um, a schedule on the board, uh, Amy and I, and. We just have to look at what the the fiscal implications are. I don't think there'd be the the savings, and I understand the savings looks amazing. I mean, I I would love to contribute to the savings, and, you know, and help our district out. Um, however, um, we were looking at the basically it's, it's a split schedule, and so we would have teachers teach five classes out of six, and they could go from you know zero to five, and then uh, just have their one prep time or they could go from one to six, or we could even keep our current seven period and have teachers teach one to six or two to seven and split the day up a little bit and they'd only have one prep. They teach five, the kids could still take, you know, all seven classes. I just don't know what the financial impact, you know, I, I didn't work out, you know, what teachers, how many teachers we would need. We'd have to go through that process. Um, the one thing that I know about split schedules, um, it does impact, uh, um, um, professional development, it does impact uh, like staff meetings because uh, if you have a person who's on that early schedule, you know, we would have to come up with a way to incentivize them to stay, you know, that extra hour and then stay for the meeting afterwards. And I don't want to impact our, our, uh, our collaboration time at all. So that, that's one of the drawbacks to that schedule. But I, I don't know the numbers on that. 
Well, and I, and I trust that we have the, the staff in place to figure this out. I just want to make sure that we don't sacrifice the, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know if we were talking about this to our staffs yet, so I didn't, I didn't share this with my staff at all yet. We've just been talking about it at the leadership level at the site because um, I didn't know if this was um, information to be shared yet. So. And we plan to have further dialogue with Dan and his team mm -hmm. um, going forward, too. On the details. This is Zandi, our, our DP coordinator at Cordova. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi there. I'm Zandi Yanos. I'm the DP coordinator and the new um, CP career program coordinator. I was also a teacher at Mitchell Middle School um, at the start of the MYP program. Um, the uh, awesome thing about MYP is that it has a holistic approach where each of the eight subjects are considered equal. There are, there are no electives. They consider them all um, just as important as the other. Um, MYP needs to have 50 hours, 50 instructional hours for each of those. Um, and just as Dan said, the design has been embedded into science. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy uh, Strawn, who um, couldn't, couldn't be here tonight, has, uh, she had sent, I believe this is what you were mm -hmm. referring to, she had sent a couple of actually two potential schedules um, that would uh, n not keep the strength of the program as it is now, but if we were forced to a six period schedule, we could um, try our best. So to not to not to have program. to have you go too deep in it. I, I trust that it could be done with <laughs> with. Uh, well, so you had mentioned, or it was mentioned, that there are schools in the area that have a six period schedule for MYP, and there are. But most of those schools um, are actually, they have a zero period. Um, and all, almost all of them had a zero period, and most of them have seven period schedules. So in, our, in the Sacramento area and kind of a little farther out of that, um, most of them do not have a six period schedule. So it's kind of hard to follow an example. Um, but the zero period schedule is a little challenging for our students just because of access. Like, a lot of them come in on the bus from Mitchell Middle School um, to attend. So yeah, we could have an offer maybe the seventh or eighth course that they need during a zero period schedule, but it would really eliminate a lot of the students who are, um, are considered IB uh, world, world School students, which is all of Mitchell Middle School. So it would really um, narrow down who would be technically an IB uh, student. Okay, all right. Th Unless Thank transportation you. were provided for the zero period. Okay, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> if Dan, you could send me where you got your suit, that would be yeah. great because that's a great <laughs> suit. <laughs> <laughs> for, um, I have every intention of trying to get this meeting done by 11. I realize many of you have to be in the classroom tomorrow, so I'll try to hone in, speed this up a little bit. I'm going to chime in on special friends. I support it. I'm still a little confused about how we're saving money by eliminating it. Um, it's my understanding that some of the, the funding is coming from EL and LI and that we're overspending those dollars. So if we're overspending our EL and LI money, we need to get into, we need to be on budget with that money. We shouldn't be overspending that money. So um, I am not a, I am not in favor of um, eliminating special friends. I think it's, a, it, provides a wonderful service for our young students that um, in the long run is worth more than what we're paying for it. We're making you know, the success that we have it at that young age. I don't need to go on about that. Um, um, let's see, I got special friends summer school. Now, Folsom Lake um, High School. Um, first of all, I do want to say that I support taking it off of that camp, off of that location, especially now because of those apartment buildings being right mm. on, on top of them looking down. To me, that's a safety issue for those kids. Um, they're too visible to that apartment complex. What I am very concerned about is moving it and changing the model so much. Um, those kids are there because they need the daily contact. They need the personal uh, relationships with staff. They need the extra nudge to get across that finish line to graduation. I'm not sure, I'm, 
personally, I need uh, more details about how we're going to service those kids before we move forward with this. That's where I am with this. Um, but on the other hand, we got to find a way to save $500,000. I personally would like to slow this down and give um, staff and the district some time to really formalize what that model is going to look like. I guess my question is if we just closed that campus and moved it as with as condensed a staff as possible to provide some same level of service for those students if we could save any money just by closing that campus and moving them. Um, I realize that we have to come up with an answer if we take any of these things out of consideration. So I, I was sitting here and going, well, what can we pick to replace that $500,000? I'm not going to, we're not going to sell enough summer school health <laughs> courses to make up $500,000. Um, so I have concerns about moving too quickly with Folsom Lake uh, and just closing it and without knowing more details about what this is going to look like. Um, so that's where I am with Folsom Lake. I think I covered um, everything on my list. We do have a number of speakers that we're going to limit to two minutes. Um, if you feel like you don't need to speak because your program has support, just say I or whatever. Um, special, special friends. friends? If you're still here, if you'd like to speak, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members and um, Superintendent Kalian. I know you all received letter of support from myself, myself and, and Carmen Wiley, the other school psychologist who um, co-coordinates the program. And I won't go through all of my details since I do hear your support, although um, uh, Trustee Clark, I have not heard from you, so I'm not sure what yours is. You do? Oh, wonderful. Um, I do want to make a few uh, uh, mentions, though, to you, just so that you uh, get my perspective on it. Um, the second step lessons that teachers are uh, encouraged to do in the classroom, that is not mandated right now, and I can tell you with certainty that many teachers do not do those lessons. Um, and they also do not do them to the, the level of uh, uh, detail that our program does. We do 12 weeks, 45 minutes a week in small group instruction, and we have extended extension activities that go with those lessons to really uh, make sure that the students can start to generalize those lessons to themselves and into the uh, classroom. Uh, the other last thing I wanted to, to just mention really quickly is that the 4.2 FTE uh, would affect 12 classified employees. Those are part-time employees and 12 people would be out of a job. So thank you, thank you. and thank you for your continued support of the program. State your name and oh, I'm so name. sorry. Suzanne Mancuso. Um, Jennifer Foster and then Colleen. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jen Foster. I teach fifth grade at Theodore Judah Elementary. I sent everybody a letter yesterday in my support for the lead teachers. And I just wanted to take a minute to um, address two of the things on the What We Sacrifice slide that you posted a few minutes ago. I don't know if you want to pull that up. But one of them is um, by losing three of our lead teachers in the proposed cuts, we would um, sacrifice continued support for guaranteed and viable curriculum at the next at the level currently staffed. And the other one is the support of PLC implementation des des designated at each site. Um, currently, I am a coach for the district, and I work closely with these lead teachers, and I feel it would be a great loss for us to have this department be cut because what they teach us, we directly teach our teachers at our sites, and those that directly influences for the better our students at the classroom level. So um, I don't have a lot to say other than I give them my full support, and I know that many of my colleagues also give them our full support, and we hope that you would um, go ahead and do Mr. Reed's idea of hiring the attorney, taking the $500,000 savings, and keeping them on. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to go home and go to bed. <laughs> well, make sure you catch the ending before you go to sleep. If you hurry, we'll probably still be I'll on. I'll catch it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Colleen? And then we'll, um, we have a number of speakers on Folsom Lake High, and Mr. Carlson will be up after. 
Colleen, finally. <laughs> Hello, my name is Colleen Viegas, and I'm a parent at Empire Oaks Elementary School, and I'm here representing many other parents who feel very similar to I, how I feel, um, that we that just couldn't be here tonight and obviously couldn't stay up this late. Um, last year, the intervention teachers were cut from um, the Folsom schools, which was a major loss, um, particularly at Empire Oaks. Um, they were a big support to the students, the teachers, and the principals of those schools. And now I hear that the curriculum and instruction department will be possibly cut, the lead teachers. Um, this is a major concern to me as I, um, as a parent, because the curriculum and instruction department is a direct support to our schools. The teachers need to feel supported in this district. So I, su I suggest you find other areas to cut in the budget, and I love that attorney idea. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Carlson, picked a heck of a meeting to come to. <laughs> okay. My name is Jim Carlson. Uh, my wife, Beth, and I have uh, lived here in Folsom for about 25 years, a little over 25 years. We're big supporters of public education, big supporters of the Folsom Cordova uh, uh, District. We had two boys uh, that graduated from uh, Folsom High and got a very good education. Thank you. And uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, a few years ago, uh, my, my wife has uh, spent 10 years on the Bond Oversight Committee, and um, both of us were asked a few years ago to um, sponsor the Measure G. We were the uh, we volunteer we accepted that invitation, put our face and our names out in the community, and hopefully helped pass it. Now I see all the things that are happening around town with Measure G, and we're real pleased with that, and, and feel proud of that. Um, and that's all great. Now, as I hear you tonight, I did pick quite a meeting. I don't come to these very often, and I see that uh, you got a lot of a uh, lot of challenges. But I, I'm here to say, um, I really don't want to see you close uh, Folsom Lake uh, High School. I work with those kids; they need the special um, attention. You throw them back into the uh, big school, and they're going to have troubles. It is a um, most of them don't have the same privileged background that my kids had and some of the kids of the parents that were here tonight. So I just want you to, I want to urge that you watch out for them because they need help. And um, many or most of them would not graduate if they didn't have that special program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a, a number of speakers on Folsom Lake. Lake. So Helen, followed by Doug. We have a student. Oh, well, what the heck? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, sorry. I, if I would have known you were back there, I would have kind of tried to bump you up a little bit. OK, sorry. Um, hi, uh, my name is Emily Grundle, and I participate in SAB. Um, I go to Folsom Lake High School, and I attend this school because my mom became uh, very sick when I was in freshman year. I missed a lot of school because, you know, I wanted to spend as much time with her as I possibly could. Um, realizing how much school I was missing, I was put into independent studies, and that did not last long because I needed more one-on-one -on -one time with um, teachers and peers. Um, before, before I got, I got to, to the school, school, my grades dropped and I lost my mom, who was my best friend. Um, I wanted to give up so bad, but the school showed me that even though I have life problems that are beyond my control, I still have a chance to succeed. Growing up, I watched my family struggle because they didn't have the same opportunities provided by my school I attend today. Um, seeing the problems I face makes me want to succeed, but without this school, I cannot. Um, I would have no choice but to potentially drop out because I don't have the options that um, many other children have. Um, and seeing this school um, being so easily taken away other than any other schools makes us feel unwanted and uncared for. Please take into consideration the pain and stress brought upon us by this. I would also like to add that since our school is smaller than most, we are like a family, so please don't break up our family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waiting patiently for this meeting. No problem. Uh, hi, I'm Helene Scratt, and I'm here for two reasons tonight to talk about Folsom Lake High School. First, I'm the president of Seroptimus of Folsom, El Dorado Hills. And 
in that capacity, we have partnered with Folsom Lake High School uh, to provide a three to eight hour module course on career planning and uh, continuing education. We also provide scholarships to the graduates of Folsom Lake High School. I'm also a parent of a special needs um, son. Wow, sitting here today, I don't envy what is clearly a daunting challenge before you do to reduce uh, some expenditures. And I, I fully understand that, and it's tough to make those trades. Um, Folsom Lake High School provides a service that is unique and really needed. Just as we sat here this evening and listened to all these parents talk about their concern of what happens to their sixth grader and what school they go to, you can imagine the impact that it would have to turn around in December and say to the students at Folsom Lake High School, next year you're not coming here. I mean, the, the stress that we talk about for elementary school kids is even more significant a stress for the students at Folsom Lake. Um, I know these are tough uh, decisions you have to make, but I think it's really important if we can try to keep the integrity of the Folsom Lake uh, model, and I appreciate the comments that you made in slowing this down, let's decide, let's look at some alternatives because the what we gain on the Folsom Lake High School slide, speaking as a parent of a special needs child, independent studies and those kind of things are not what these kids need. These kids aren't hopeless. Please don't make a decision here on budget that, that turns them into hopeless. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Doug, followed by Brian, followed by Bob. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Douglas Postma. I'll be representing Powerhouse Ministries this evening. Um, I. Uh, my directors are out of town and they regret that they can't be here, but I did provide you a letter that they wrote and I will be reading it. Um, I realized I did not give you enough copies, so if you need one, I have more right here. Uh, the letter states, to the members of the FCUSD school board, it is with deep concern that we are writing this letter in regard to the proposed closure of Folsom Lake High School. Powerhouse Ministries has had the honor of working with at-risk students in our community for the past 27 years. Many of them have attended the Folsom Continuation School. The local, regional, and international businesses that are thriving in our city are built upon the quality educational system in place. It seems a profound injustice to reduce the quality of education to the marginalized youth in our community. In the last 10 years, we have seen a dramatic increase in graduation rates among low-income and disenfranchised students in our community. We directly attribute this trend to the personalized opportunities created by the faculty and staff at Folsom Lake High School. With the rise of homelessness, drug addiction, and mental illness, this is the time to be increasing the services we offer rather than eliminating them. We believe that by cutting preventative services such as this continuation school, we will ultimately see increased expenditures for public health, law enforcement, and a whole variety of social services in the years to come. It is our recommendation that necessary budget cuts be shared across the entire district rather than targeting the most vulnerable students in our community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Signed, Nancy, Ashley, Executive Director, and Josh Levine, Student Pastor. Uh, and Folsom Lake High volunteer. Thank you kindly. Brian and then Bob. Brian, for or either one of you first, Brian, then Bob. Hello. Hello. Um, Brian Nichols, I'm a teacher at Folsom Lake High School. And um, um, I wanted to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, Mr. Hoover, um, thank you for asking the question earlier um, uh, about uh, whether or not um, ADA, uh, a loss in ADA from the drop students dropping out or going to other programs would actually affect uh, the savings to the district. Um, uh, the superintendent uh, answered that question with, uh, uh, I don't think she answered the question. 
I think that what she what she said was that she told you what the cost per student at our school was, but she did not um, really answer the question. So I'm here to talk to you about some assumptions. Um, and the assumption is, is that if our school is closed and um, folded into a hybrid model at Vols Folsom High School, that the district would save $500,000. That assumption assumes that 100% of the students at Folsom Lake High School will actually attend Folsom High in that model. And I'd like to make a different assumption. In fact, the exact opposite assumption. That if you close our school and you tell them to go to Folsom High School, that 100% of the students at our school will not attend. If my assumption is correct, then that cost an ADA based on $11,993 per student per year. It would cost, the loss of ADA would be $659,615 per year, netting a $159,615 yearly loss. Also, our enrollment right now is at 55 students, but over the past years that I've been working there, our average enrollment is about 90 students. So we have a low enrollment right now, but if you assume that the enrollment would, the, the demand for the services would be the same from year to year, then if you were to lose 900 students worth of ADA, the cost to the district would be $1,079,370 a year. The net loss would be $579,370 per year. Both of the assumptions are false. Of course, we're not going to lose 100% of the ADA, but we are also not going to retain 100% of the ADA either. I can tell you that I know that that's the truth. <clears throat> I propose that you don't make any recommendation on the school closure without a more accurate understanding of the true cost of the closure of our school. We need to have some sort of agency that's impartial and independent actually look at how much money it would cost the district if they closed our school because I believe that many of our students would just drop out, or go seek their education somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I got Bob left, Bob Quinlan. And then I believe our last speaker of the evening will be Monica. Bring it home, girl. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, and thanks for the time today. Um, I just found out about this issue on Tuesday, so I'm gonna read my notes so that I can stay structured. My name is Bob Quinlan. I'm a past president of the Rotary Club of Folsom in 2007 and 08. During my term, I approached the Folsom Lake High School principal about how our club could help Folsom Lake High School since we helped Folsom High School, but not Folsom Lake. Since then, our club has provided funding and mentors and I've been the advisor for what's become an interact club in which students voluntarily give up weekly lunches to meet and define and perform community service projects that benefit Folsom and its residents. The best example of a student expelled from Folsom High School is a fellow past president of the Rotary Club of Folsom, <coughs> Jack Kipp, who would have, been a, would have probably gone to Folsom Lake High School had it been an option, but he went to a Sacramento high school. Folsom could have lost a student that ended up being mayor of our town seven times. Schools are investments by the community. How do we quantify the return on investments of graduates of Folsom Lake High School that have, been, have benefited from alternative education offered at Folsom Lake High School? Oops. Some argue that public schools teach students how to work for others. Yet how many entrepreneurs benefited from alternative education like Folsom Lake High School and what were those returns on investment? Today, students at Interact shared that they probably wouldn't graduate from Folsom High School 
where they felt they got lost due to their classrooms of 36 students compared to the classroom of 10 per class at Folsom Lake High School. I strongly suggest you keep this community asset open. Thank Thanks you. very much. And, and thank you. And I wasn't accurate. We do have one more speaker after um, Monica. Dan will be the closing act tonight. Dan, after Monica. Meryl Parrott, I have three kind of questions. Uh, the first is suspensions. The second is preschool. The third is PE vis-a-vis -vis summer school because they're related, interrelated. So the first, I have a, I guess a point of information. Do we have a mid-year, um, do we know where the needle is going in terms of our disproportionate suspensions? Because that's that $500,000 magic money that would be, you know, it would be nice to not have that. And does that actually factor into this budget? I would imagine that it would. It does. So do we have, um, do we have ongoing measurements of improving that? And um, it might actually be interesting for the IB programs to be able to show their rates of suspension um, versus some of the other schools to show the, the factor of how that actually, when you go to a middle school with an IB program, that it positively affects that, that needle. So, so that's my first question. And then the second, or the second question is regarding the preschool funding, if we have an update on the preschool funding that, or the preschool services we're, we are required to provide, but that the state does not reimburse those costs at all. I believe, I believe there was some discussion of uh, people going downtown and talking to a, legislation, a legislature about that. And then my, f my third question is about, uh, it's kind of a point, and if we think outside the box, and as long as we're talking about getting rid of um, PE instructional specialists, um, for example, at Folsom High School, um, if the district were willing to entertain, um, let's just say, let's start with the marching band and look at the number of hours and instructional minutes that those students are on the field and moving around and in synchronized fashion and getting quite more of a physical workout than the instruction they receive during the school day and PE class, then that would eliminate, let's say on any given, like, I don't know, 150 kids would no longer need to do their second year of PE. Maybe we keep it for freshmen, but not for the additional years. Those, those same music students who have impacted schedules, those are the ones who are signing up for summer school because they have to do PE to graduate. And so I'm not sure if, I'm not sure um, if there is any leeway of how we define that PE requirement within the district, but it seems like across the board, and that's just starting with marching band, there could be, um, when, when uh, my second son was uh, in high school and he wanted to, he was trying to figure out how to fit PE into his schedule, uh, he was told he had to be nationally ranked in cross country, to, that he, he needed a national ranking. And he said, well, mom, that's really easy. I'm the last number. I'm the highest number that they have. So I have a ranking. It's just not something that people are actually publishing. But that I'm putting, <laughs> so I should, I'm, and I'm putting in the hours of running and running and running in this fulsome heat. Why do I also have to do PE? So it's something that, that actually could factor positively into our budget considerations. If we think outside the box and look at, look at um, something that would be a positive thing for a budget, a positive thing for a marching band and some of the other athletic um, things. And that also factors into the summer school. How many students are taking the district summer school and or, and in, in my family, they, they do summer school all year, all, all summer long, because they also do options for youth to meet the requirements, the graduation requirements. So, um, and please don't try to make money on the music students who are already paying about $1,200 a year to do jazz and marching band and would also have to pay some exorbitant fees when we can get it for free from options for youth in July. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dan. This will be quick. I, I got an inspirational message uh, on my phone, and I just wanted to make it really clear that uh, Amy, Zandy, and I will do anything we have to do and that we can do that's in our power to make uh, the IB program work on a six period day. Thank you. Thank you. That's very reassuring now. Yeah. Okay. Any um, additional comments from the board, questions, recommendations? Um, well, I'm going to start by, it sounds like there's 
pretty much unanimous support to take special friends off the list. Yes. Okay. I think we're comfortable with the explanation for IB. We all like the retirement, correct? Yes. What, yeah. What's left? Just Folsom Lake? Yeah, Folsom oh, Lake High School. Oh, uh, uh, aligning the kindergarten. We're good with that. Right. All right, we're all good. Um, what? P lead teachers, we're, uh, we accept the compromise that was reached. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big one is Folsom Lake High. Good. I, I think the speaker made a good point. We need a little bit more information on those uh, on that one. So uh, I know we're going to go under Walnut Wood, but uh, are we? Is, they won't be able to go under Walnut Wood, and they're just going to be offsite. Where where are they going to go? I mean, he makes a good point. Yeah, and and I think we might be. We already have um, kids that are disappearing from our district that we don't know where they're going. Right. Um, if you look at the monthly enrollment report, there's 26 kids that have left Folsom High and Cordova, and they're right. not coming to our alternative programs. So maybe we need to really develop an alternative program that might allow right. us to right. retain those students. Right. So and we, yeah. we can look at that. But it. Oh, go ahead. No. No, I think we just. I think we got. We can look at that. Yeah, I think more detail would be good on it. Um, you know, I also. Um, I, I'm, I'm absolutely willing to consider closure um, as long as, you know, we obviously have a good program to move these kids to, but also, um, you know, that it's definitely going to save costs. And so I think if it's, if the risk, if there's risk that it may not be a savings or, you know, I, I think we need to get a little more detail on that as well, because I don't, you know, I definitely don't think we should even consider closing it unless you know we can kind of in, ensure that's going to help so uh, so um i guess we need a motion um if we have mr reed did you have comments on any of those if we uh, no mr clark uh, no i i just it was moving to hear about Folsom lake high and and being a rotarian i am very familiar with the interact club and it's not that they give up you know their lunch you know once a month or once a week they do a lot in the community too because they take pride in their community so i appreciate you coming up and and talking about that so can i mention one more thing um we do have kenny high school as an option too that does still provide um, the option for students and transportation would be a consideration so that would be our alternative to look at yeah so so do you so let, let's see if we can get the board to come to some consensus here because um, that's, that's what, good what, what, what kind of motion are, are you? Do, oh, is this a discussion only? It's just no. a discussion. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's sorry. Right. That's giving <laughs> a little late. <laughs> okay. We don't have to take <laughs> action. Now we have to provide <laughs> the direction that we want to see. <laughs> um, those come back, but if we don't yeah, support yeah, one of them, yeah. figure out how we're going to close it. Right. Thank you for the clarification. And, and I would like to see how it's compounding, like we're maybe some model, you know. I know we're not going to close it, but we'll have to still look at other avenues. And what a difference of uh, looking at this for a year and coming up, re researching options in the area and coming up with a plan that mm -hmm. might be um, something the board can review before making a decision. Um, so do you have? Do we have direction on that? <laughs> Are we all yes. good? Yes. Okay. We're good. Just a, one more point of clarification. You know, whatever we're taking off the list takes us under where our goal is right. and what the county is expecting. So if there is something else you want us to be exploring from any of the other ideas that have been put mm. on the 21-22 or, oh. Pete, you know, there's some uh, other ideas that were There sharing. was a lot, big, long list. Uh, as long as they're away from, honestly, away from impacting kids and our staff. So if there's other ways, I think that list... Uh, that is there mm -hmm. on that other list that you provided there that would even look at scenarios and I think that yeah I think the I ready thing uh, still um, and it uh, it might be interesting Chromebook, the Chromebook idea and the Chromebook idea yeah. and it might also be interesting to get some more Dave's details on idea. this uh, in in-house counsel uh, yeah I, I did have a question about I ready um, right now I ready is goes I don't actually even know what what grade does that go up to all of our microphones have died. 
<laughs> the meeting has gone <laughs> so long, the batteries are dead. Um, it, it does go into the high school to the point where they do some assessments with it, but it is used primarily K-8. And if I'm being honest, K-5 much more intensely during the day every day. Yeah, and, and um, I was speaking with a principal recently who, who asked me the question, is it possible to save iReady for K-5 and uh, eliminate it at, you know, from sixth grade on? And um, I didn't know the answer to that question. And, so, I, and I don't know what, if there would be a savings, savings at, at all. all or not. So currently, um, the license for it expires this year, at the end of this year. It is not in our budget for next year at all. So if we are looking at any... Um, so first, yes, um, we could negotiate a price that only encompasses so many students. You have to buy a per student license, um, but it, it's it's not it's going, going to be savings. savings. It's actually going to be an addition if we renew the license for the following years. It's already out of the budget yeah, that's um, going forward. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and then, and I want to go back to Folsom Lake really quick. I want to reiterate. I don't I don't necessarily need to see them on that campus. Because I think we could generate some savings if we move the program retaining the quality of it onto a, a site on Folsom High School or somewhere in the district that um, could accommodate them in a small feeling environment. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if there is a savings saying we have to move that program off, and if we shut down that site, and you know if that allows us time to um, look at how this might look on Folsom's campus. It might be baby steps towards changing it. I don't know if there would be savings to that, but it's just what I'm throwing out that I'm not necessarily expecting that they have to stay on that location because it is just, the apartments are right on top of them. So um, do we have any reports to, Superintendent, do you have any reports to the board? We have two yeah. more discussion yeah. items. They are, are. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> but they're discussions, okay. so they'll come back at the next meeting unless you have any questions. <laughs> so does anybody have any um, first revision to board policy BP3350, travel expenses? Anything to add to that? Thank you. Um, is there anyone from the public who has stayed here until 10 to 11 to comment on that item? Okay, seeing <laughs> no one. Okay, first reading, revisions to board policy 5126, awards for achievement. Any recommendations to change that policy or anything that's we want to see? Then they'll come back on next uh, meeting's agenda consent. For your um, reading pleasure and compliments to staff to for bringing us this information um, in this format. I think it's been very helpful and a lot of work went into that, so thank you. Um, and another, the communication and community engagement strategy action plan, thank you. Um, now, reports for the uh, Board of Education. Hey, Mr. The, Reed. On, on the information, uh, 11, or what is that, 12B? the communication and community engagement strategic action plan. Is it possible to add marketing of Folsom High School to that plan? I think that would be included in the strategies related to um, marketing where we have needs. It allows us some flexibility um, and uh, would also probably be involved under our current strategies on stakeholder engagement related to our um, impacts of our boundaries decisions. It would be nice if we could have a special highlight that we're focusing on, on Folsom High marketing. Thank you. Reports, any reports to the Board of Education Superintendent? Yeah, I just wanted to comment that one of the consent items that was approved tonight was the resolution that we shared with Governor Newsom and with our legislators about not being funded for special ed preschool. So that was the next step of that action that we took and that the board approved tonight that we'll continue to um, dialogue with our, our state leaders about the need for the funding that we don't receive for special ed preschool. Thank you. Um, Scarlett, do you have any comments? Um, well, it was a long meeting, so there's a lot to comment on, but I will just keep it short. I really like what Miss Merrill said about the PE. I have friends who do dance for hours after school every day, and they still are required to take a second year of PE. So I would really like if we could look into that. Um, also for summer school, she touched on this also, but um, paying for that, for the students who take music or even student government, that they can't fit in those courses that they have to take throughout the year. 
um, paying for that. At least if we could support the students who couldn't afford it, then that would be nice. That's it. Um, any board members have ready for comments? Mr. Short? I'll keep this short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, please. I, I just want to thank everybody that came out and had a really good meeting on all the dialogue. And I know there's some tough decisions have to be made in boundaries and budget, but I think that the staff and the community were really engaged, and I think we're doing a good job uh, to collectively. So I'm really proud of this district and what we're doing. I know budget cuts are hard to do. Uh, but we're going to figure out a way. We're going to work together on it, and I'm really confident that we'll find the solutions and not create more problems for ourselves. Uh, so this is a great district. That's fantastic, and so thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Clark. Yeah, I just um, want to thank the parents that came out uh, to discuss the boundary issues, also the support for Folsom Lake High School. I don't want to see it close. I'll just go on the record and tell you that right now. Uh, I think it's a very valuable program. I just think that we need to find additional resources to help our kids exceed. Uh, also, just for the record, special friends, I come from a, a background of working with uh, people with disabilities, so it has my, my full support on that as well. Um, do you want to make a quick comment? Congratulations to Vista Del Lago High School football program as well as Folsom football program. Uh, they both made it into the playoffs, and I uh, look forward to uh, supporting them moving forward. That's it. Thank you very much. Mr. Hoover? All right. Um, uh, thank you to everyone that came out tonight to express your opinion and your thoughts and concerns um, for my uh, thoughts on the boundary changes you can rewind the tape um, <laughs> and watch them online um, and uh, I just want to thank the staff for all the work you've done on the budget I think uh, not only did you come up with a lot of good ideas but in a lot of areas a lot of buy-in as well from uh, all the stakeholders so really thank you for um, for 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 all your hard work in, in that in that regard Thank you, Mr. Reed. No report. Um, I want to thank the whoever planned this agenda. This was really poor planning. <laughs> this was, we, I never thought we'd have to put a limit on meetings, but um, I want to thank the community for coming out, and I think the process worked, and I think we found an area where maybe we can um, adopt a solution for the boundaries. I don't think we're that far away with the proposals that were put out. Um, so... Um, and I appreciate all the work staff put into it and all the work they put into the budget. We have, you know, they have to go back to the drawing board if we take Folsom Lake High off that list, but um, I think we can find other areas to trim to at least give us more time to explore what is the best way to improve our that program. Um, and we did, one thing that, I, before I forget, we approved, um, the completion for Theodore Judah, and I don't need an answer to this right now, but there's a portion of uh, fencing that probably would um, add a more complete look to that campus. There's some open areas, and mm -hmm. as we move forward um, with, you know, eventually Folsom Hope is going to be over there eventually. I think there was a plan to make sure that there was complete fencing, so um, I can follow up with Matt on that if you don't mind, but that, I just wanted before I, that was on my list to mention, there was some areas that I thought, did, were we supposed to do more fencing? So, good night. Good night to all the viewers out there. Yeah. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Was it the shortest or the longest? Oh. Holy cow! It wasn't the longest.